You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. Hey, how you yeah. doing, man? Yeah, and today's guest, we've got the ghost. Yes, indeed. How are you, big man? Not too bad, not too bad at all. 20 years in prison, come out, changed your life. Yeah. Great story. Yeah. Big fucking unit, were you? About 6'4", 6'4". 6'4", I think, do you know what, to be honest with you, I think I've been about 6'4", since I'm, since 19 years old. But um, yeah, I like to think I'm edging up 6'5 now. My growth just literally just stopped still when I was kind of hoping for a few more inches but i think mine stopped mate when i was 12 13 yeah yeah <laughs> that's it how's life bro yeah life's not too bad you know um just uh after a long time trying to reintegrate into society it's uh it's a uh, it's a nice change from where i've been you know so yeah, yeah um busy man the yeah. world moves fast good yeah before I get into it, I know I always like to go back to the start of my guests. Yeah. Get a better understanding about you, right. where you grew up, how it all began. Yeah. Uh, so um, I'm a Kenyan town boy. So, you know, I was born, I was actually born in Uganda. So I came here when I was a kid. I came here when I was six, seven years old. And um, I've grown up in an area called Kenning Town in Newham. Um, I, went, I went to school there. Um, and I went to, my secondary school was always there as well. So to be honest with you, my trouble just started since I've been a kid. I've been kind of like a, you know, like a troublesome kid growing up. You know, those kids that you always have to shout at to stop doing stuff. And but um, I feel I feel like my life kind of like took a a downward spiral when I got to secondary school. You know, it always does, it when there's girls and there's lads that are out um, out of school doing uh, extracurricular activities. You always get caught up in stuff like that, you know. It always starts off with smoking a bit of a puff and the rest just goes down the rabbit hole, man. You know? What about family? Uh, my family, I'm from a good family, to be honest with you. I'm from um, my mum. My mum, uh, she's a working woman. My dad, as well as a working man. But um, they split up when I, when, I was at, when I was 16. But they're the good people. I'm that, the black sheep of the family, you know. No, not such a black sheep, but back mm. then growing up, I was the uh, the black sheep of the family. See, before the split up, were you kind of okay, like I say, the usual suspect, smoking a bit of puff, getting a bit in trouble in school, like minor stuff, were you, was it everything kind of okay, or was there telltale yeah, actually, signs? Yeah, no, could... I actually didn't make it through school. Yeah, I didn't finish school. What age? What, did you get expelled? Uh, yeah, permanently, for selling drugs in school. <laughs> yeah, I got caught, I got caught set, trying to, uh, it all started with, um, once you start smoking uh, weed, um, you have to find a way to finance or, do you know what I'm saying, support your habit. So I got I got an idea, a brilliant idea as a kid, I don't know where I got it from, that um, you know, maybe if I start dealing a bit of weed myself, that would be able to finance or be able to support my, uh, I'll be able to smoke for free. So, you know, I don't know what got into my head, but um, I thought, do you know what, school would have been the best, uh, a uh, place to look for clients and you know it, it was the worst idea so i sold drugs to a to a young kid in school and uh i think the kid he, he must have smoked a bit too much and he wasn't responding um to his mate so some two two young kids come up to me and they, they said to me um you know we have you got some weed for sale so uh being a bit suspicious, I asked them, you know, um, who's told you, you know, all that type of stuff. And they're like, you know, everyone knows in school and blah, blah, blah. So I thought, you know, what? all right, boys, like, you know, they got little, their little coins out, you know, got a little 10 pound bag, went around the back of the music block and um, they rolled it up, smoked. I don't know what happened. It might have been an epileptic fit. I don't know what happened. And you know, funny enough, I've told this story in the past and I've had people in the comments saying, he must have had some hard drugs in there. <laughs> but you know what? Drugs respond differently to everyone, innit? So um, yeah, no, he had an epileptic fit. His friend didn't know what to do. His friend ran to the school teacher, the nearest teacher. You know, you always get teachers patrolling the school grounds and stuff like that. He grabbed the school teacher. I said, here, here what? My friend's not responding very well, you know. And um, so the teacher, 
came around. He could smell that the kids had, you know, been taking something. To be honest with you, with kids, you can tell, you know, someone's been taking something, their pupils dilate and stuff like that. And um, he asked him, you know, in order for us to get the right help, you're going to you're gonna have to tell us what's just happened. And they said, yeah, we, we smoked some, some weed. And um, they asked him, who did you get it from? So, you know, who else other than me? You know, um, the kid pointed out, pointed out that it was me at the time. I didn't even know I was in school. I was in class, actually. We were in class. Um, so the police got called in. You know, um, I was just sat, sat in the class, you know, I get called out, you know, at the class. To be honest with you, um, one of my friends um, is here with me today. He, 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 he told me, listen, I've, you know, I've heard the police, I've heard the police talking about your name, what have you been up to? So I kind of like, it's it, it taking me by surprise, um, but I still had weed in my, in, my, in, in my bag. You know, I remember it was a Black Knight bag. And um, at the time, I started panicking. So my friends come to me and they said, listen, I heard this, you know, teachers talking outside, the police are here, I don't know what, what's happened. You know, um, I, I, asked, I, I asked the class, I, I kind of used to be like the popular kid in, in class. You know, I used to give people a hard time, but also I'm kind of like, you know, a cool, cool type of guy. And um, I remember this one kid, right? This one kid um, volunteered to help me. And I've been wedging this kid for years. So out of the whole class, no one actually responded to help me because at the time I was panicking, right? Um, the kids stood up and said, yeah, I'll help you. So at that precise moment of time, I felt guilty because I've been wedging this kid for a long time. I remember the kid as well, right? Um, and his name, I remember everything about this kid. You never forget this shit, right? So the, the, they come in and knock on the door and I said, yeah, Adam. I said, that's my name. I said, can we have you out, please? So I step out of the classroom. So I've got a, a bird call. I've got a heads up that the police are here. So I stepped out anxious. I said, what's going on? They said, yeah, we need you to step in this room. Right. So obviously there has to be like a present adult that, you know, that's, that's responsible when the, when the police are just, you know, questioning, you know, it wasn't like questioning, but just asking questions in exchange. So they asked me, they said, oh, we've got word that you sold some drugs to some kids and they're not responding, you know, very well. I'm denying everything. Swearing blind, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. It had nothing to do with me. Next thing I hear a knock on the door, knock, knock, knock. I'm thinking, what's that? Right? The same black bag that I gave this kid who I've been wedging, right? <laughs> He's handed it over to the teachers. And to be precise with you, I could swear I could see him through the gap. He had a smile on his face, you know, and that was it, man. That, from then onwards, my life just literally spiraled out of control. From there, you know, you get kicked out of it. And to be honest with you, I think that's the first time I've ever been like arrested as well. They took me to a police station and uh, they held me in, in, in a police station because obviously I had the drugs, you know, so they held me in the police station. Um, recently, I found out that kid, obviously, you know, that kid was a, he was a cadet. He was an aspiring police cadet, right? So it was recently. I found out that he's actually a police officer now. Well, it'll snatch it makes yeah. sense. Imagine that. that. Imagine yeah. that. I found out now he's a police state. He's a he's a, he's a he's a police officer. Yeah. I, someone someone messaged me and they said, "Hey, you know that story that you were telling? Do you know what that kid is now? Because obviously one of the kids was, was mm -hmm. I was in school with. I said, "No." I said, "Yeah, yeah. What about him? Because obviously I said his first name in in, the, in, the, in my last podcast. They know exactly what I'm talking about. I said, guess where he's working now? He's a police officer. Now I'm like, fuck it now, bro. Do you know what I mean? But karma, in it. And from then, you know, um, obviously from, once you get kicked out of school, you go to uh, you, you, centers, you know, that like centers. A secure unit? Like yes, yeah, so, yeah. Like, now nah, yeah. secure units are like, you know, like yeah, kids yeah, that yeah. arrested. You go to like, um, sh you know, community centers and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So it's not quite school. For the kids who can't, the yeah, teachers the, who can't. Yes, kids, yes, yeah, kids yeah. that got the uh, behavioral issues and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So you go there. And once you go there and you start mixing with other kids that just like you. <laughs> game over. It's game over, man. Mm -hmm. What did your mum say? Oh, man, you know, I, I do not, the amount of stuff that I put that woman through, you know, in my life, it's only now that, you know, once you get older, you start to realise um, the stuff that you put your parents through and uh, you think to yourself, well, you know, how can I put her through this? Because that's that's not the first time I've been in trouble. You know, that was just the beginning. So, you know, so she was very, very disappointed, man. You know, you always try to shift the blame. Um, throughout my whole life, I've always tried to shift the blame. Like, obviously, I'm not snitching, I'm giving names, but and my mom asks, you know, when your mom comes to you as a kid, who's done this? You're like, you know, obviously, you can't snitch, but you always have to, 
uh, say it's, uh, some of someone outsides, you know, because if your mom finds something, she finds a, a, a bag of drugs and she goes, Who's are these? You have to say, Mom, because you don't want to throw them away. You have to say, Mom, it's not mine. I'm holding it for someone type of thing. So that's just to try and dim it down a bit and not make yourself look, you know, guilty. Yeah, that not a bad human being because you yeah. don't want your mom to feel like she's failing as a as a mother. You know. Did you feel that then that you didn't want to? Break no, her as much every as time, every time, you know, even robbing kids in school, you know, robbing kids. I remember I came up with a stupid idea. I've never really said this before. Yeah, I remember. Do you remember thirty three tens? So I yeah. never had a phone guy in the school. Like neither of my friends would never had phones. So for you to actually had a, have a phone was like a big deal. So we're going back about, I don't even know what year this was, but these 33 tens were like a big thing. I remember once I wanted one so bad and um, came up with a plan. We're still in school young and we, we, we um, pretended to um, use this kid's phone, but we played past the parcel and I ended up with a phone. And, you know, obviously the parents came to the school, you know, my son's phone has been stolen and, you know, the parents come, knock on, you know, find out where you live. So this kid's mum and dad knocked on my door, you know, looking for the son's phone. And I actually had it in there saying, mom, look what a phone I found. But I just robbed it in school. And that was an embarrassing situation for my mum as well. Do you know, growing up, you can kind of see the intricacy because as I've grown up, I've actually even realised things about myself is that uh, I'm a pre-planner. You know, I'm not an erratic, irrational person. I like Calculated. to cat. That's me down to the T, you know. Even throughout the whole year, the whole time I was in prison, you know, the uh, I always, obviously I had phones and stuff like that in prison, you know, in prison you have phones and all that contraband that you're trying to hide from officers. So every time I'm walking through the prison uh, setup, I'm always looking at, for hiding spots and where can I hide this? My mind never switches off, do you know what I mean? So I'm always consistently playing a game in my mind. I never switch off. because so I've always, I think I've, that's something that I've realized as I've got older, that I've always been that type of person I like to pre-plan and I'm the type of person that acts calm when the lights are on, but as soon as the lights are off, you know. You're an organiser? I like to organise, yes. What about if you're like, labelled with like OC, OCD or anything? Have you ever had Do you know what, tests? to be honest with you, when I was a kid, I think I'd, I started picking up a, like, you know, even my walking pattern, you know, like you mm -hmm. step on that square, I can't step on that square. Yeah. I started developing something like that when I was a kid. Um, it's only, I, and I had to fight to get out of that because it was taking over my life. You know, like I'd step on that square. That, you know the little squares that you get? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, on, 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 on the, the road when you're walking. I'd step on that square, that square, that square, that square, that square. And eventually I, was, I realized that, yo, you know, every time I leave my house, this is becoming an issue for me. I got to try and just walk straight, you know, and it doesn't matter what square I step on. Mm -hmm. But as I've gotten older, I'm a, uh, pre-planner man so what happens then after the little centers and you kind of school's over so um so i went into selling drugs weed yeah to, to set up a little bit of weed full time and um obviously i just started selling drugs selling weed i sold a bit of coke as well as it as it went on um i started investing in in, in guns you know i i loved guns i've had i've had this obsession with guns as a kid growing up um, the first gun that my mom found was a shotgun when I was in school. No, not in school, what am I talking about? When I was, when I just left school. So I must have been about 16. 16? How old are you when you're 16? Were well, you in college? Yeah. When I was, yeah, when I was in college, my mom found, the first thing that my mom found was a shotgun. And she actually binned that. She threw it in the bin out of all places. So uh, my sister f come to me and she said to me, mom, oh, you know, you know, you know, mom just found. I said, what did she find? She told me she, she found this big gun that you've been carrying around. And to be honest with you, I, I only had it to scare anyone trying to rob me or, you know, I don't, the guns were going for cheap that, you know, them yeah, times as well. I think I bought one for five, for yeah, yeah, 500 quid, quid yeah. I, bought, I bought a shotgun, 500 quid. I think about it now, I think I probably even got, got done over because, you know, like 500 quid for a shotgun, man. It's a farmer's, farmer's shotgun. We're going back about 15 years ago. Like, you know, it's, Is that it's a sawn off? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was sawn off, but it's still, even though they're sawn off, they're pretty. So they're still very hard to yeah, conceal, man. Yeah, yeah, very hard to conceal. My mom found that she she thought she'd do me a favor, <laughs> threw it in the bin. The bin men came, you know, pick up all the trash and just trash it and get rid of it. So I, I was actually pissed at that. She never said anything to me up till today. We've never spoken about her throwing my shotgun. The only reason I know is because my sister told me. You know, if my sister never said anything, I would, it would have never it would have never came to mind that you know. Maybe your mum found it because she's never pulled me on it. 
Second time round, she finds a 4-4. Uh, snub knows that I had <clears throat> a little revolver I had, yeah. This one was easier to hide. And these, these times, they were guying. They were expensive because they, 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 they pack a kick, right? And they, um, they're easy to conceal. So I used to keep it in a white sock, right? Because I, I, I don't need to have gloves. Do you know what I'm saying? You just pull the thing in a white sock and you just shoot whoever you need to shoot, right? And even though at that time, even though the shells were really long, you know the bullets that you get for them mm. 4-4s are really long, fucking things intimidating. You're thinking, oh, whoever I ever hit with this is instant murder. You know when you're 16, 17, because we never grow, grew up with any olders or, you know, like older boys to influence or doing anything. This always solely came to us. You know, we, just, we, we had to pre-plan things. So we never really had any outside or older um, Influence. Influence. Why is that then? Why where did, was that watching movies, computer games? Where did you get that? <sighs> Do you know what? I think it's just I, I wouldn't say computer games because we never used to play a lot of computer games or, or movies. It's just so my area. We never had any older guys, but the na neighboring areas they had, like you know, like the older boys that yeah. would influence the younger boys our age. So we were pretty aware of this, and we were aware that because we never had any older guys. If any situation did come up and it gets real desperate, we got to be able to do something about it. So we invested in guns. We bypass knives. To be honest with you, I don't think I've ever even, I think I've used a knife probably like twice or something like that. But more, I've used a gun more than I've used a knife. I've always been more of a, a person that prefers a, a gun because it's a clean, you know, it's a clean... Uh, it's a clean use, you know, it's one stop drop and you, and you, and you go rather than a gun, very, I mean, a nice, very uh, messy. A sentiment you know. as well. Yeah. Because you need to get close up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but also with a gun, to be honest, surprisingly, I'm a, I'm a close up type of person. I've always been close <laughs> up. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, I'm not, I don't believe in uh, moving cars, you know, because I've always seen people doing, you know, drive by shootings like, ah, it's a bit messy. Now the police have seen what car we're in or the witnesses have seen the car that the, gun, the gun's coming from, the bullets are coming from. How far are we going to get away, you know, before the police come on top of us and we're going to be trapped by cameras. So I've always been one of those guys, you know, me and my guys have always been those type of guys. We pull up, two roads down, you know, <clears throat> I take a walk. I know exactly where you are. Or, not, or you know, pull up outside your house, you know, in a <laughs> stolen car. Fucking move the seats back, stop neighborhood watch from, you know, seeing two buds chilling outside your house for the past two hours, you know, put the gun, two two cars in front, yeah, you know, you always get the um, parked off cars, two cars in front, you put the gun on top of the uh, wheel, we just slump the seat back, because the worst thing would be to, to be chilling in a car with a gun and a fucking neighbor's seat and then ring the police, the police pull up, you know, you're in there with a gun in a stolen car, now the person that you're about to carry out, whatever you're going to carry out on, is aware that two geezers got caught outside your house with a gun or whatever. That's nonsense. Worst, worst case scenario, the police pull up and we have to, just, you know, drive away. The gun's left behind. Nothing, you know, you're none the wiser. But I've always been a very close up person. I don't think I've ever done any bit of work from a distance. You Where know. does that cold heartedness come from? Because anybody who uses a gun as well, over 90% miss because it's... This and shaking. And no, no, no. I walk. Yeah. I'm, I'm so real where crazy. Does that, right? Where does that ruthlessness come from? Um, I think it's a, uh, it's. So me and my friends, we, you know, I don't, I don't really want to spoil the thing as we go along. It's a. Uh, I've so I, I've, I've been, I've been stabbed and stuff like that. So you know, I've had because uh, I had a, a hip put on me. You know, growing up, after I had the gun confiscated, <clears throat> got into a situation where, um, you know. We, we allegedly carried through a, an attack and it ended up coming back being, you know, the person who got, you know, attacked was related to um, um, like a big, big guy at the time, you know, um, and then money's fucking been put on. I only found out recently, to be honest with you, I found out about seven, eight years ago how much supposedly that money was and that was supposedly meant to be a hundred grand, you know, but to be honest with you, being stabbed that in hindsight just I felt the, you know feeling the pain and all that type of shit that shit changes a person so to be precise I don't know for me I just like to do a clean job you know I've always been like that. I'm very like I said to you the OCD type of thing I like to do something clean and swift and 
you know precise yeah precise i don't i don't do to be honest with you i've never took took out a gun unless i was willing to use it and i've never really done any you know i've never shot at anyone unless i've shot them do you know what i mean mm -hmm. not shoot to miss to frighten no, somebody no, 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 to no. Say, oh, i've never i've never I've, bad yeah, so I've never pulled out a shooter at anyone and just threatened them with it or i've never pulled out a shooter at someone and just shot at them and never hit them it's always been closer than closer than what you and me are right now I'm talking close and personal type of shit. But I'm also swift and I'm not one of those guys that get carried away and, you know, yeah, you know, fucking overkill and shit like that. <laughs> I've always yeah. been straight to the point. Yeah. When was the first time you got in serious trouble? Uh, which way, on the street? Or? Yeah, on the street. Uh, when I had that hit that uh, put on me, uh, I didn't take that shit serious, you know. Um, How was that feeling for then? Big unit, six feet four. No, I wasn't at the time. I was like a seventeen year old kid. So you you still were you small? Yeah, I was skinny. Ah, but your small's probably still tall. Yeah, no, yeah, I was skinny and tall. Um at that time, I I um had a picture of mine taken off the internet because I used to try and do music. You know, when you're a kid you try to get into hobbies and stuff like that. You saw my picture, you know, when you try to one thing one thing that I realized Is that why you got stabbed, bro? <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> Seriously, one thing that I realized that you, like, I don't know how rappers do the whole gangster thing mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you know, be on road and still rap about that shit. Because if you've got any worthy adversaries, they would actually put you on your toes <laughs> or put you on your ass. Do you know what I mean? If you've got anyone see half as serious, you won't be able to talk the shit that you're talking. And if you're actually are involved like that and the cases are not solved, you can't rap about that shit. Otherwise, you end up in prison. I'm sure you're seeing that shit now. Yeah, but uh, Tupac and that, like, who was the guy who fucking talked about who was involved in a Tupac? Murder? Orlando. Yeah, no, he says he was in the car. Keefy D. Keefy D. 20 years later, he thinks, okay, I'm out, and he's fucking singing like Canary. But the thing is, <laughs> that's, that wasn't a closed case. Never? Mate, it wasn't One a closed case. the biggest unsolved murders of all yeah, time. That's, that's what I'm saying. Like, it, that was, like, the biggest thing. And, and do you know what, to be precise, you don't do things like that. Do you know what I'm saying? My shit, I can talk about my shit because I've done the time for yeah, my stuff. Of course. We talk about the things saying? you've been charged with, the things you've been things that are you've unsolved. Been in prison with. You can yeah. talk about things unsolved, man. Yeah. Listen, I don't mind people saying allegedly that yeah, yeah, we're yeah. not daft as well because yeah. it comes back and bites us in the ass. Yeah, do you know what I mean? But I watch people sometimes and I think you're talking right out of school. Yeah, the yeah. police ain't daft. The police yeah, will be yeah. fucking watching every podcast about exactly. because of the names that are coming forward now. Exactly. And it's crazy. And Keefy D, like I say, fucking idiot. Yeah. Oh. I think he'd done a deal when he was in Vegas or Miami. Yeah, but his it, deal was never to go back into Vegas. Though. Yeah, and to never speak about it because he spoke about it somewhere else. He's charged. Finished. I would still love to know who done it, but I think that... I don't, I don't think the guy that he says done it, done it. Yeah, because be they all talk a lot of shit as yeah, well, yeah, but it's yeah. still interesting. Yeah. Because yeah. I was a massive Tupac fan, that's who I grew up with, man. Oh, I, man, I, man, I still listen world. to the music today, but... The whole world was... Yeah. That was, that was bad crap. How old man. are you? I'm 33. So you're still young. Yeah, I'm still young. Do you know what I mean? So when you get stabbed out, did that change everything again? From, I don't want to go through that again, so you need to yeah, get more Yeah, so ruthless. when I got stabbed... Um, when I got stabbed, that sent me even worse. You know, you get certain people that get stabbed or shot, and they're um, they go legit. You know, you get certain people that turn into priests after they get stabbed. Now they're preaching the word of God. Hey, nothing wrong with that for anyone that's watching us. It's happened to you. It's just everyone gets to call in at different times, so you can get called, roped in even deeper into the game, or you can say, you know what? Oh, I got a taste of that. That's not for me. You know, but for me now, um, I felt like um. The job wasn't done, you know, because that precise moment of time, I think I was picking up some drugs and cars and bikes and shit like that pulled up. And then I got rushed, hit first and foremost, um, with bike helmets, chains and stuff like that. And I did, funny enough, I was unconscious when I got stabbed. So I didn't, I didn't even see who stabbed me, you know. Um, so I, all I remember is I was getting put on a stretcher and um, this was broad daylight, you know. We're going back about... 2007 something like that you know this is years ago all right um and I was, I was in a coma you know for a little while so when you do wake up and you got things in your throat you know like you know that, that tube in your throat and you got tube in your you know in your dick and shit like that and you know you haven't been eating for the past couple of days you know because you've been in a deep sleep or whatever um that actually changes someone 
you know. So I'd rather get caught with it than without it. So after that, um, I started carrying my gun all the time. You know, I started carrying my gun all the time. I uh, preferred a, a shotgun, you know, because it's even if I miss, I can't miss. You know, if it comes down to the crunch or, you know, if a group of people manage to find themselves in a situation where there's a group of people again, I'll just fire off whatever I've got. And if I miss you, if the wadding doesn't hit you, the pellets are going to hit you, you know, or hit your friend. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? As a collective. So I remember this one story where I uh, I got into a situation at college and um, I remember getting rushed out of college. So that time, this precise moment of time, I was with a girl, lunchtime, going to get, um, get, going to get some lunch. And I don't know why, man, it's always girls. This girl says to me, oh, did you see how those boys are looking at you? I didn't even see the boys looking at me. But you know, once a girl says that, I don't care who you are. If your missus says that, you see her, what, what's, the, what's their problem? Straight away, your back's up. So you think, right, what's going on? What's going on? So I ended up getting a situation where I ended up getting, you know, roughed up and stuff like that. So I jumped on a bus. I wasn't driving at the time. And I went home and got my shotgun, right? Went home and got my shotgun, jumped back on the bus. I came back to the college because this happened at the college. And after the boys had rushed me and done whatever, they dispersed and went, went about their own business. I see one of the boys that was supposedly involved in the attack. So I chased the boy down. So the boy, smart as he is, ran towards the college, but there's an estate in the college. He just didn't want to get seen by a group of people running down the college screaming. He didn't see exactly what I had because he was too far away. Like I said, I like to walk close and personal. And to be honest with you, if I'm going to be completely honest, I wasn't going to shoot him outside the college. Fucking outside the college, just broad daylight. I would have probably just roughed him up and just baseball batted him with the gun, with the butt of the gun or whatever. But he saw me. Yeah, you know, they always say people are brave in a group, but when they're one-to-one, -one, they start to crumble and break. So he started running. So as he's running through this estate, I've chased him down this estate, right? Got close enough to him, and I've hit him with a shotgun in the back of the head, right? And Clarice just started pouring, and he started screaming hot, louder than it was before. All of a, t all of a sudden, neighbors are coming out, and your attention is getting grabbed. He gets up, shoots off towards the college, starts pointing, you know, at me. So now that I remember there was a black security guard at the college who was looking at me. I've seen the situation, assessed the situation, um, cut the corner, went into the bush, stashed the shotgun, came back into the college that nothing's happened. Because the last thing that I need to do now that I've attacked this kid, right, is fucking leave the college for police to come to my house. I'm thinking, right, if anything's going to happen, let it happen at the college. Because it started off at the college anyway, so it might as well. They're going to take me away, let it be at the college. So I've stashed it in the bush going to, to my class. I was doing art and design at the time, sat in an art and design class. Remember this happened at lunchtime, lunch is finished, we're all in there. Fucking kids pointing, snitching, saying, geezer's got a gun, he's fucking whacked me in over, over the head with a gun, blah, blah, blah. So as I'm sat in a classroom, even up to today, this is something that kind of takes me back how it ha actually happened. So the armed police gets called into the college. So I'm sat there, you know, fucking, we're all drawing and shit like that. The, the tutors, none the wiser. Right, they call the tutor right again. Remember the story I told you about at school? <laughs> it's happening again in college, but this time it's a gun. So they call the tutor right again. The tutor's gone outside. I think they must have asked the tutor which ones, which what, what tables McGann's is sitting on. That's my surname, Adam McGann's. What tables is sitting on? He must have also grasped me up. You know, there's them, them little glass panels. I could see movement there. Next thing, they rush the college. I mean, they rush the class. Oh, police! Rush the class, yeah. Straight to my table, right? They, get, they tried to get to me before because obviously my bag, I had another bag, right? I used to have a bag and a folder I used to carry art and design. So they rushed to the, the table, grabbed me, threw me over the table, you know, drop down, all of that type of shit. The students that I'm with are not from the street, right? They're fucking petrified. They're thinking, what the hell is going on? Now, what they couldn't do is call students out one by one just in case I go on a schizo one and I get the gun out and they decide to take one of them hostage. Remember, I supposedly just attacked someone outside the college. So now they throw me over the table, take me into this holding room. They ask me, where's the gun? So I say to them, what gun? They say, we've got, we've got um, strong accusations, allegations that you've got a gun. Where's the gun? Where's the shotgun? I said, I don't know what you're talking about. They said, we've just been called in. Where is the gun? You know, they try to do this whole intimidating thing. So I said, listen, 
all I don't know what you're talking about. I got into a situation with someone. I didn't even tell them that the fucking kids just rushed me. I got into a situation with someone and I pulled out a, a, a scaffolding pole and he ran. That's what he saw was a scaffolding pole. It wasn't a shotgun, right? So they asked me, where's the scaffolding pole? I said, I don't know. When he ran screaming, the fucking, I threw it. They said, so how's he got the, 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 the uh, how's his head split open? I said, I don't, he tripped. As he was running in the estate, I didn't get a chance to get to him. He tripped and he fell. And he bust his own head, allegedly, right? So um, they let me go. And furthermore, to be precise with you, they were fuming. This is a waste of police time. You know, obviously the other kid, yeah, they, they, they found nothing. I'm thinking it's nothing, it's cool, it's fine, right? Two months later, I'm chilling in my mum's house. At this time, I managed to, obviously because of drug dealing and stuff like that, I managed to save up a bit of money because I put my mum through some, some, some shit and I've managed to fund her holiday to go abroad. So she's gone back home for a trip. So I'm staying at my mum's house. And to be honest with you, I precisely because of the guns and the drugs and stuff like that, my mum had kicked me out at 16. So my mum had already kicked me out. So anytime I come there, I can't sleep over. But because I was drug dealing and I, I was carrying guns and stuff like that, from, plus I wasn't driving, so I used to catch cabs and stuff like that too. I'm from my mum's house. So I used to live in an area not far from my mum's house. It used to be called Manor Park. So I used to get into a cab and, with my drugs and my, my gun and shit like that. I remember I, I'd been stabbed in that already. So like I said, I'd rather get caught with my gun than without it. I've managed to save up some money, send my mum abroad because I put her through some shit. As she's abroad, this whole situation's happened at the college, right? Sorry, situation's happened at college, sent my mum abroad. I'm at her house asleep. I hear a helicopter above uh, the, uh, the roof. All the houses are stacked up together, right? My house is in the middle of the street. The police can't, they're not looking to leap six gardens just to get to my back garden and stop me from escaping through the back. So they, got, they, got a, they hired a helicopter to secure the scene at the back. So if I manage to escape through the back, they've got the light on me and the light can just follow me, right? So I'm, I'm laying in my, in, my, um, in my bed, I hear a helicopter. I'm thinking, yo, what the fuck is that? I jump out of bed. I don't know what I was thinking. I just jumped out of bed and I ran, them, ran downstairs. At the time, it's just me and my sister, older sister in the house. Ideally, I preferred to be, you know, in this neighboring area, in my mom's area where I've grown up. So my drugs are there, my guns are there. I don't have to be traveling back and forth from my house. So Saturday, Sunday, so Friday, Saturday and Sunday, I'll spend at my mom's area, in my mom's house, cause she's abroad. And it will be easy for me to sell my drugs and stuff like that. So anyway, helicopter, yeah, above the roof. I jump out of bed, run downstairs, right? Get to the bottom of the stairs. The door flies off again, Woof. right? Oh, police, again, yeah. Laser beams on my chest, I'm in my boxes. To be honest with you, I don't know where I was running. <laughs> I don't know why or where I was running. I don't know what was happening. You know, you get flight or flight, for, is it fight or flight? Yeah, fight or flight. I just jumped out of bed. I don't know where I'm going. I haven't even put any clothes on. I don't know why Why I'm doing what I'm doing. It was like secondary. It's panic as well because exactly. you've been stabbed before. Exactly. So I get to the bottom of the staircase. The door flies open. Lasers, shields. They're screaming different things. One saying, get on your knees. One saying, hands behind your back. One saying, don't look at us, look the other way. So I'm thinking, mate, fucking hell, man. What is it, right? Oh, fucking hell, I get on my knees, right? And then they say, stand up. I'm like, fucking hell, hands behind your back. Step backwards. So I'm stepping back. They nick me, right? Take me, throw me into the back of the car. The, the guns and the drugs and the coke, it's in the back of the garden. I used to hide it between my mom's house, the fence, and the next door neighbor's house. So if you do find it, I can actually say it's not mine. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So they put me in the back of the car. I'm in the back of the car shitting it because me and my sister never really used to see eye to eye at the time. I'm thinking, fucking oh man, at least they'll be doing me a favor taking me to prison at this case because my sister just experienced some shit that she's never going to forget. So they've drugged her out as well because the, everyone just has to get mad. You know when the armed police come in, they manhandle everyone. Right? So they threw my sister in the back of the car. I'm just waiting for them to find the, the, the dogs come in, 
search police come in. Obviously, armed police come in there, secure the scene. Normal police come in there and they search the, the house and everything. They didn't, they didn't find anything. They didn't find anything. I was waiting to go to prison. I was like, right. I'm trying to calculate the years in my head. <laughs> they come in, they say, yep, yeah, all right. You know, let him in. We haven't found anything. I've gone in a house. I've sat down for a minute. My sister's fuming. She's popped upstairs. I'm waiting for everything to settle down. I'm thinking, what if I go back into the garden and then the helicopter just pops out? I know it's, I just chilled for a while. After the next day, gone back in there, checked. My drugs are there. My Coke's there. My gun's there. Happy as Larry, right? I'm thinking, that's it. They've come to the college. They haven't found anything. They come to my mom's house. They haven't found anything. But in the back of my head, remember I told you I got off a, a, a flat somewhere else I was staying. I'm thinking, they can't possibly come back for a time. So now another month's gone by. Obviously, during these periods of time, you know, I'm giving people a hard time. Uh, obviously, now as you go to learn, as you, you, you get older, you learn. Unless people have information that you've got a gun and you're, you know, you're jamming it on people and all that type of shit. The police can't act on information that's not there, you know. So I've gone back to my place now. My mum's managed to come back to her, to, to her house. I'm asleep in my house. I had scaffolding around my flat, right? Because they were re, re, revamping the whole tower block that I was on. I'm sleeping. My shotgun's on the windowsill. No helicopter this time. Plus, this time I managed to get a, a plastic door reinforced onto my flat, right? Because I've seen police raids, right? So I, I can say to you, I'm a, I'm a calculator and I like to sit down and think. So I've, I see how wooden doors pave in, right? So I'm thinking to myself, I gotta get a plastic door. That'll buy me some time to throw the shotgun out, flash the coke, whatever I've got, you know? Because when the, the big red key comes in, right? To hit the, uh, the door, some of that energy flies back and that buys you time, right? So I've got a plastic door, reins, thick one, reinstated at my flat, I'm sleeping. So as I'm sleeping, I hear, poof. They come in the middle of the night, they come out of nowhere. I hear, poof. I'm in my boxes again. My heart's just sunk again. I'm like, shit, the shotgun's right here. I remember my bed used to be here. The shotgun would be right here. Sawn, sawn off shotgun as well, yeah? I jump out of bed, not thinking again. I grab the shotgun, open the back, fucking, uh, the, uh, what you got, the balcony. I threw the shotgun out without looking. It hit an armed officer. <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> He hit an armed officer, he fell off the scaffolding, right? The rest of him, because I, I didn't look. I just opened the door and just threw it, because I, I, I'm hearing a noise coming from the front. But little do I know these fuckers have climbed round, yeah, and covered the, uh, the, the balcony, right? Because it had the scaffolding, it had the net, everything, right? It's hit the armed officer, all I know is that torches disappear off the far end, right? The rest of him, just there you are! Fucking hell, man. I'm thinking, shit, this is, it can't get any worse. First time I went to prison when I was 18 for position of a gun. Uh, when the shotguns hit him, it's opened. The shells I've dropped in a black wire free bag that I used to carry the shotgun in. That's it. Arrested me for possession of a firearm, uh, position of ammunition, all that type of shit. Went to court. Obviously, uh, got into court. You know, I played this whole, you know, I've been stabbed. I'm, you know, I'm, I, I was paranoid. You know, I almost died. What would you expect me to do? You know, da, 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 da. I got three years to 18 months. That was the first time I went to prison. What prison did you go to? Uh, I went to Chelmsford. Chelmsford, I went to Feltham, and then I went to Rochester. Adult prisons? So Chelmsford's an adult prison. Mm -hmm. It was like an adult and wild. The rest of them were youth. Like, but they're like 18 upwards, 18 to 21. How was that getting there? When I got in there, I was like, is this it? You know, because everyone, you know, as a kid, you always have that, oh, if I go to prison, man, that's kind of what's going to happen. When I got in there, man, I was like, whoa, this, this is, this is nothing. You know, I'm going to go 10 times harder when I get out. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because obviously in there, you just mix and mingle with your friends and it's all a good laugh in it. Like, Do you know what I mean? But, um, so when I got out, that's when I actually started getting serious. Do you know what I mean? I've got out now because I went in 18, I got out, you know, 
19 turning 20 because you do 18 months three years you do 18 months right yeah fuck sure because i remember going in at 22 and i was thinking i'm going to get fucking shagged in here yeah I yeah was thinking that's it <laughs> and then as soon as you're in you realize how easy it yeah, is yeah, it's fucking junkies and exactly all wasters exactly. and you realize it's, it's not as bad obviously your freedom your time i love the party mm -hmm. i love the women so i miss that but you realize it's a fucking joke yeah yeah so when i got out this time I needed money, man. Like, I wasn't trying to drug deal no more. I wasn't trying to, you know, I ain't got time to be drug dealing. Before, drug dealing was my preferred choice of hustle. But now I've got out, I'm robbing, you know. And like I've said to you, we don't do, uh, you know, like, roll the dice, pre-planners. You know, we do inside information. So, yeah, uh, invested in guns and just went straight to work. Went straight to work. Um, the first bit of work that we did was, um, I think it was like a politician or something like that. This guy was like a high-end politician. I was on a podcast. <laughs> Giza tried to get some information out of me. Oh, where was he from? I was like, dude, I'm not going to say where. But this guy was corrupt as fuck, though, because this guy was minted. Minted. He had shitload of money, you know, um, laying around. But, um, yeah, that was the first bit of work. And that, that, that was decent pay as well. You know, Is that the first time you had a bit of dough, proper money, uh, from selling from, a bit of coke, bit of weed? It's not that much, it's not that lavish. Was that yeah. the first time you tasted a bit of... Yes, that was the uh, first time we've hit, we've hit like a big lick. Jackpot. Yeah, hit a big lick. So I, we didn't stop. We didn't stop. You know, this guy, he, he, he had money lying around. You know when you hit someone and they've got, you know, let's say you've got um, money in your house, you're not gonna keep three mil or a mil or 700 grand in one safe. You're always gonna think smart. You think, listen, I gotta get a couple inbuilt safes just in case. Any smart person will think, if anyone ever flies the door, or if my friends turn on me, or if my friends fucking find some kids to come in my house and take my shit, or if anyone ever comes in my shit by, by coincidence, I gotta have my money split up, or I gotta have a, a, a safety safe, you know? So if they do come through, and then manage, I'll give them a hard time, but eventually when I manage to cough something up and I open the safe, there'll be 200K in there, they'll be happy with that, you know? So in that situation, that's, that's what this guy did. But that only fed the fire that was inside to keep going, you know? We got to a stage where we were plugged in, like, and I mean, like, plugged in, Vietnamese people plugged in because they used to grow the uh, cannabis fact factories and stuff like that. Plugged in with the Albanians, plugged in with the white boys that move bricks of coke and shit like that. So whatever you need done, it's 50-50. You know, it's not, I wouldn't screw you over. Our business is built on trust, right? Even though, you know, they said it's not honor amongst thieves. Well, this one there was, you know, because without you, this 50% wouldn't, wouldn't have been possible. And I'm going to need you in the future. So I see it as a long-term investment. I don't see it as, oh, you know, this guy set up 300 grand and we're going to take it and just turn around and say there was nothing in there or we're going to take it and, you know, just give him 20% of that. Whatever we've agreed to is what, it's what we've agreed to. And not just that as well. You're the inside man because you're going to be in that fucking house when we come in that house. Yeah. And because most of the times people will fall out, drug dealers fall out. You talk down to me, I feel a type of way about it, you know. Oh, I'm not happy with the split that you're giving me, right? Because you feel, you feel like you've done more of the work, even though I've financed it, right? I just get my mates on there, right? You're, you're shouting 70% and you're giving me 30%, even though we started this business together, now all of a sudden you've turned on me. Okay, no problem. I've got someone that will do 50-50 and I'll be happy with that. And on top of that as well, I'll be in a house. Okay, I'll take a punch in the face for 50% of that. And I'll watch you get your head kicked in. And on top of that as well, they'll come through acting like they don't know where their stash is. And they'll fuck you up. Give me a bloody lip. But compared to what you're going to get, it's nothing. And I'm going to get 50%. And on top of that as well, we're going to carry on working together. Because you're going to think both of us got robbed. You know, so the game is a filthy game. It's rigged. But me, on the other hand, me and my, my friends, how it would work is that after we sting or we rob your pal, 
will give you your 50 percent but now your job's not done if your pal finds out that it's somewhat me or my friends that were behind it it's your job to convince him not to react to take that loss because if you fail to do that you know we're gonna shoot you or I'm going to shoot you. <laughs> One of my pals is going to shoot you. I'm going to shoot your friend as well. Because we're going to be paranoid that you could have that played us and played him as well. So it's your job to make sure that that's, that doesn't happen. And if you fail in doing that, just get back to us and let us know. The guy's not hearing it. He's coming for it. So we can act before he does and try and knock the wind out of him. So you have to be an agent either way. It doesn't end there by you just giving us information. You have to give us information until the thing's flatlined. There's no repercussions. The guy's moved on. He wants to reinvest in something else. How was it starting to have a good bit of money behind you? Was that a throw? Was that a buzz? Did you yes, feel yes, sort, yes. Sort I started power? spending money stupidly. You start to spend money because you're thinking, I just made that in 20 minutes. You I think it lasts forever, don't you? Yes, yes. I made that in 20 minutes. I'll get it back. So, um, second time I went to prison, right? This time around, so I've been, we've been banging jobs. We, prolific. Now, people say to me, you know, when I've done my first one or two podcasts, people are like, you know, oh, you know, he's a nice guy. I didn't know he'd done that. The reason you didn't know that I'd done that, because you did not need to know. You wasn't part of the circle to know that I was doing that. And on top of that as well, it benefited me nothing in no way whatsoever for you to know that. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Because we're not working together. You did not need to know who has been getting shot, who's been shot, who I've shot, or what I've been doing until I've been arrested or I've been caught up in shit. Now it's all like in the open. All right, guys, I, yeah, it was me. But other than that, the name of the game is longevity, right? To go as far as you can without anyone knowing that you shoot us doing it, especially people that don't need to know. Do you know what I'm saying? That's the name of the game. People don't last long in the game because they like to show a boat and tell people that this is what I'm doing. I'm doing it now. You know, like the drug dealers and the flashy cars. Then you get someone like me and my pals seeing you rolling around. We won't come on to you like that, but the, re the homework starts initially there, start ringing around. The people that we already are in a mix with and we get reliable information back, how much you're making, how much you got stored. But we don't, we never read, we used to really do drug dealers, you know. We loved higher ups, you know. But um, so much so that we used to, we didn't, we didn't just used to do, do, to do robberies in England. We would fly out in other countries and do robberies, you know. Um, places, last, last place that I went to before I went away, Holland, you know. I was the youngest there by 30 years. That's how prolific we were, that people would vouch. You know, the white boys our age, they'll get the old, the pups on there. I said, dad, I know this guy. You know, he's fucking on it. He's, he's proper, he's, do you know what I mean? We can get him on this job, he'll do it. You know, on top of that as well, I'll throw something their way if they can get me on that. You end up finding yourself in another country. You know, last job that we're gonna do in Holland, Big Lorry. Right, computer chips. Now at the time, we're going back about 15 years ago, computer chips, the boxes, I'm not talking about the little ones, I'm talking about the big computer, big computer chips, yeah. The box goes for 25 to 30K. This is 15 years ago. We had a plot that we we're going to do, fly over, stayed on a piece of land that this guy owned. There was 10 of us there. Everyone was in, everyone that got flown in, specialized in different things. So you had a lorry driver that was flown in specifically for driving the lorry. You had people that off. We had uh, people dressed up as police. So when this lorry comes across the port, we had a snatch van. Furthermore, we had two snatch vans, right? The snatch van, so it's one way. The lorry will be coming one way and we have security on it because because of the uh, expenses of what's in, inside this lorry. As soon as it comes off the port, it's got a little security following it to make sure that it gets to, to um, its de a designated spot. Comes down a one way, we've got the whole route mapped out. As the lorry's driving down this one way, security's following behind. Our, our snatch van's broken down on the side of the road or just parked off. As the lorry gets close, we cut them off, right? 
the lorry comes to a standstill. The lorry comes to a standstill. Behind the security, we, ha- we had uh, uh, police. People dressed up like police. You know, the little detachable thing that you put on top of the car? They pulled the security over. Security pulls over. Tie up the security, throw him in the back of the car. Move the little security car on the side. We throw him in the back of the what? The fake police car. Now, <clears throat> me and someone else would be me and someone else's job to get to the lorry driver. Because the lorry driver, what they tend to do at the time is snap the key in the ignition so you can't move the lorry. So now we have to, as soon as the van pulls out, the snatch van pulls out to block them. Me and and the driver rush the the lorry, try and drag the T hammer the window, drag the uh, driver out before he snaps the key in the ignition. And the lorry driver gets in there. On top of that as well, I've got a jammer on me. You know what a jammer is? Yeah. So I've got a jammer on me because these lorries are tracked up. They'll be able to find them like that. If the lorry comes off route, they'll say, hey, this lorry's come off route. Rather, we get in the, uh, in the lorry with the jammer so the signal's cut off. So when we get it to this safety spot and start un- fucking um, unloading it, putting it in another safe, uh, snatch van, the security goes in, in the back of the lorry, so does the lorry driver tied up and we just leave him there. Jobs like that. Do you know what I mean? So we were... Active. <laughs> active. What was feeling. it like doing a robbery? What was that feeling, the buzz you had? Uh, can, can I tell you something? Um... Um, it, I, it was, it was very, uh, it was thrilling, but the thing is, uh, I came to do, to, to, to do the robbery with, out no limitations. What I mean by that is I would like for the robbery to go to plan, but if you misbehave, you know, I'll put a bullet in your back if I have to, or in your ass if I have to, or in your, do you know what I mean? If I have to. I'm not one of those robbers that's going to beg you, please, please behave, please behave. So I saw it as, it was exciting, but I've done way worse shit than this. You know, for me, this is a walk in the park. And to be honest, to be precise with you, I, in my head, played it. This is what justified my actions is that what is in that house belongs to me. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm retrieving what's mine already. What's about to happen has already happened. That helps calm you, calm your nerves down. You know, you get certain people that are like, oh shit, man, like there's so much cause. No, I'm not doing anything wrong. This has already happened. It's already reported in the papers. Not just that, this shit is mine. I'm not doing anything wrong. So I'll go straight into tunnel vision. And we had different forms of entry as well, you know. So, you know, with sledgehammer, you know, enter your shit with a sledgehammer, or preferably quietly, as you're going into your house with your key, slide right in behind you, stick the gun right into your ribs, walk you straight in. By then, you know, it's not the first time, you know, we've been around your house. We've done the ho- our homework. We know that you drop, you've already dropped your kid off to school. No one in the house. Your missus has gone work. You've got a dog. We've been doing the homework on your whole movement. You know, we know where you go to work. We know what time you finish work because we've followed your route all the way back to your house. You know, and right now you've been caught with your pants down. So for me, there was nothing more thrilling than catching someone with their pants down. I know... I've got two, three, four, five hours in this house with you. I'm not going to use all that because it's not necessary. But I know what I'm here for. I know where it is, but I'm just going to act up a little bit. Pretend I don't know where it is. Ramsack the house a little bit. Take it because the last thing that you need to know is that I'm acting off information. And you know that someone or one, someone from your circles dropped you in it. So we just play along. Why did you never target drug dealers? Because there could have been backlash. Ah, the cash wasn't enough. You know, sometimes, and what I hated as well is, well, we've done drug dealers. What I hated as well with drug dealers is that once you do drug dealers, you've got to find some fucking kids to get rid to of drugs. Yeah. Yes, so long. I've done that a couple of times. Me and my friends have done that a couple of times. Um, slid in our drug dealers, took hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of drugs, and we have nowhere to keep it. <laughs> so now we have to rent a place. We have to rent a place to fucking keep it in, you know, and then we have to find someone else, some kids, 
hey, come here, you know. I like the local local neighborhood superhero fucking giving out all these kids drugs, forcing drugs on them. Like, hey, take this, man. Don't worry, man. This is good for you. I'll be back in two weeks. You better have my money, you know, type of shit. But that's even that. Now I'm chasing consistently, hustling for the money that I just hustled for. So preferably drug dealers, meh, you know, I never used to really like doing drug dealers. Only if there's cash, though. Cash, everyone loves a bit of cash, you know. But drugs, that was that second choice to take. Did anybody ever fight back? Th th those, uh, Did um, anybody fight back? So I'll tell you a story. Um, the guy that fought back on my case, I, sh I shot the guy in the case that rightfully tried to protect his house. Um, that precise day, what led to that was... Um, We've gone on a robbery, all right? So I'm going to read it back a bit. We've gone on a robbery. And, um, I've, you know, what I used to like to do is to alternate partners, all right? So we alternate partners, so we give everyone a go, yeah? So nobody gets, feels like they're, lost, they're, they're left out. So me, me and my friends, my friends will go with other people sometimes or we'll go together sometimes, or we'll use other people sometimes. So I managed to pick up these two boys. Um, so some drug dealer's been talking in the neighborhood, talking about how much drugs he's managed to crop down from his grow, right? And um, he's told, his, his, he's bragging to his sister. His sister's going out with a kid from the area, right? And uh, the kids come to me and said to me, listen, my brother-in-law, He's managed to bring down this little factory or whatever. You know, he's got drugs in his house right now. It stinks. Him and his sister are getting into fights about it. So I'm like, how much is there? He's like, I don't know, because the brother wouldn't, t wouldn't talk to me, right? But the sister's saying it's so much, it's smelling out the house. So I'm like, oh, that's not really information for me to act on because it's not really solid because you haven't seen it. Even though you, can, you said that you can smell what's in the house, it's not really... You're not really in bed with this guy, you know? But it's like, come on, trust me, dude, it's in there. So I go and pick up these two boys from a neighboring area. So obviously we used to, as robbers, we used to keep guns around. We'd keep stolen cars around, play up the stolen cars. So we'll have a exact same car as you or him or him, plate it up to the T. That if the police drove past, they'll think it's you driving a car. But it's, it's cloned, right, to look legit so it blends in. So we had shitload of cars around the area. We didn't just use to rob, you know, the serious work. We'll get, there'll be certain envelopes that will slide through with pictures and addresses. So we'll always navigate those to the right people. So we used to be like, you know, drugs, robberies, you know, you know, if a job needs doing, someone's been misbehaving and they need to get seen to. So we always have shitload of cars, stolen cars around. You get them for what, two, three hundred pound, fucking plate them up, park them off in the area. We got guns in the area. And the phones that we had would ring like drug dealers' lines. That's how me and my friends used to have it. Just like our drug dealers' phone rings, our phones would ring. And we always were ready to go. So we'd wake up, get together, relax, bust jokes watch TV, watch football. We had phones, burner phones that would ring. I'm in a house now, 180 grand in the house. Now I'm in there right now, 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 now a dress comes through. I said, boys, we've got something right now. So we'll fly through. We were always on call. So anyway, I go and pick up these two boys from this area. I've looked at them, they're tipsy. Something said to me, don't take them. You know, don't take these boys. But I'm fucking greedy, man. And I wasn't doing anything that day. So I said to them, fuck it, get in the car. Got him in the car, drove him to the locality, fucking to this house, all right? I can say it now, because I fucking got done for the crime, <laughs> crime but I didn't fucking do it. Anyway, anyway, we'll get to it. So, drove him to the house. I pointed at the door. I said, it's that door, yeah? He said, yeah, 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 we've got it. I've gave him the gun. I fucking chauffeured them to the robbery and I've gave them the robbery. I pointed at the door. Do you know what they've done? <laughs> they've gone to the door and they've started talking in sign language, right? I've seen fucking 
SWAT do that shit in America. I was like, yeah, no, that's, that's, I'm watching from a distance. You know, like a peeping Tom, <laughs> right? The fucking flew, flew through the door, gone in there, right? So I'm thinking, yes, I'm just in a car like this, rubbing my palms. I'm like, yes, payday today. I don't know what's in there, but I fucking took the risk of these boys because the first time I'm working with them as well. They fucking hit, hit the house, come back. They're like, there's nothing in the house. So I said, you're fucking joking. There's nothing in the house. The people at the house are screaming. So I'm thinking, if there was something in the house, those people won't be screaming that loudly because you lot back in the car now and the, the, the woman that's in the house is still screaming, drove off. Got to the safety zone. My fucking my phones rang. Again, remember I told you I used to have those burnt phones. It's a, a Vietnamese guy. Uh, he used to go by the name of Tony. Even though I'd link, uh, I'll meet this guy, and he'd say, "Hey, hey, how you doing?" You know, I tell him my name's Steve because he tell me his name's Tony. But your name ain't Tony, geezer. Listen, like, it's fine. You ain't got to tell me. But we couldn't just play that game. I'm Steve. You're you're Tony. He goes, "Hey, listen, 180 grand in his house." Come now, right? This house is in South East London. We're in East London, yeah? So I've looked at these boys, right? They've hit the fucking wrong house. They've hit the wrong house. Two red doors back to back. I pointed at the door. They must have saw me point at another door, right? Now, the reason why I know that we've hit the wrong door, it's going to come back later, right? So now I'm fuming that we haven't got anything because I was, remember, remember, I was in a car rubbing my palms, right? And they've come back in a car empty handed. With the shotgun, sledgehammer, and the empty fucking empty carrier bags, because these carrier bags are meant to store the drugs in whatever we're fucking in that house. So we're at the safety spot. Tony rings me. He goes, Listen, 180 grand in this address right now. I said, How do you know? He says, I just dropped off 30 grand. There's a money machine on the table right now, counting it. There's four sons in here. Vietnamese woman, she's my boss. Come to the house, addressed, locked off. Toilet, address, sends it through to my, to, my, to my thingy. I got an address. So there's four sons in the address, one's in a wheelchair. Obviously that's not any trouble, right? We just push them off to the side. So at these other three boys, right? Mom, shut up, <laughs> sit down, here for the cash, right? Simple job. Plus we've got guns, right? Now the reason why I prefer coming in there with guns, I ain't coming into your house with a knife and you've got a fucking gun in there. You don't know what people have in their gun, in their houses? And I've, I've seen people and I've grown up with people that have gone into houses and died in those houses. Because believe it or not, if someone comes through the house right now, wherever we are, man, you're asking to get killed because I fucking live here. Do you understand? I've got to defend this shit. My kids are in here. You know, my wife's in here. My people come here. I can't, this has to be, this is where I rest my head. You've overstepped that line. And I was always aware of this. So when I come through there, I come through, with either a pump action or a sawn-off saw shotgun with those two thick barrels pointing at you. And I always prefer those weapon of choice, that as a weapon of choice, because it's fucking intimidating. As big as I am, if someone put it out on me right now, and obviously I have to read your body language in that, see if I can talk you out of it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But I'm not trying to get hit by that. No one's trying to get hit by that. So I told the boys, listen, we're going to this house in South London, right? Don't worry about it, the moves flopped. We're gonna make up for it. We're gonna go to South London and do this. Now, in this precise job, I was gonna do it as well. All right, because I didn't want him fucking up this move. We just fucked up the last one 20 minutes ago. We're going to this one now. I'm gonna drive you. Even though I've rang a pile of man and he's come in a van, and I could have got in his van easily and just watched these boys drive to the locality or the area, I prefer to drive him there. And this time, I'm coming in that house with you. Right, just to make sure you don't fuck this up. Because imagine two fucking robberies gone wrong. And you know what, to be honest, like I've said, it was my fault. I never took them because they were tipsy, right? So we're driving. As we're driving, we've got to an area called Lime House. It's in East London. And my responsibility, I take responsibility. I've done a dodgy U-turn because I didn't want to go all the way around. So I've done a dodgy U-turn to cut into the queue. Do you know who was sat by the traffic lights? Armed police were sat by the traffic lights. What are the odds, right? I didn't even see them. But they were city police. City police, poli they police a two mile radius. Is this of London? Yeah, South, central London. Mm, yeah. They, because obviously that's prone to like, the, the, the last thing that it needs terrorist attacks happening around there. So you need like 
armed police ran that shit ASAP. So they've got like a two mile radius that they police. Fucking police have got nothing to do. They're just chilling out the traffic lights. Our bus a dodgy U-turn. They're looking at, they look at the car. They're punching the plates. So when I punched in the plates, even I used to go on Ask Mid. Ask Mid is where you check if the car's insured, right? The car's got insurance. Is it Ask Mid? One of them. Ask Mid. So I used to go and look for um, the websites that are selling cars, identical to the stolen car that I have. Take the number plates, write them down, drive to the uh, plate shop, have them printed off, stick them on my fucking mower. Bosh. Yeah. Job done. Blending in. So anyway, I've got the plates. Stuck them on the motor. The car's insured, but it's not insured to anyone. Because where I took the plates from, fucking car sales place. You know, it's not like it was anyone else's car or a private fucking seller that was selling cars. It was a showroom, car showroom that just insured the car. So now the police, armed police want to know who's driving this car. So now they're following me. I'm looking at the traffic, I'm looking at the rear view. I'm thinking, what the fuck? Why are these lot on me? The car's insured. I've got three other lads in the car, right? We've got a shotgun in the car. The guy in the passenger seat, we've already agreed to a deal. If it comes on top, it's your job to take the fucking gun, right? If you're not going to do that, let me know and I'll pass the task on someone else. I'm driving. I can't be driving and carry the gun at the same time. He's agreed. Police are following us. Coming to central London, more towards south of central London, yeah? Near London Bridge. The police lights have gone on. I'm like, oh God, I am not stopping. We're getting away. Never mind the fact that we just took a chase. I think it must have been about a month or two months before, the, like a two hour police chase. That's another story. You can pull me on that later and I'll tell you about that. Crazy story. Um, I'm not stopping, right? We're taking the chase, lads. Fucking driving, driving. The police have no idea who they're pulling or who's in the car. I'm driving, I'm driving. I'm trying to read off the posters where I'm going because I've got no idea where I'm going. I don't drive through central London. I avoid it and go around it, right? Because of the shit I've got in the car. So now I'm reading posters. I don't know where I'm going. The roads are zigzaggy. End up crashing the car. Tsh! Tourists that are walking around with cameras from Japan, fucking... Germany or whatever. Oh, London Bridge. Yeah. See a car, police, they're like, oh, turn the cameras around. Right. Who did they see? Me and the rest of the entourage jumping out of the car, winging it. Right. I jump out of the car. I told the guys, don't follow me. Right. When we get out of the car, everyone's on their own. Don't follow me. Right. What do they do? <laughs> they follow me. And at the same time, I've got no idea where I'm going. Why are you going to follow me? Right? I'm running, 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 running. I don't know where I'm going. I end up at the pier. Right? At the pier. I can't swim. <laughs> I'm thinking, fuck. Never mind the fact that I'm on license for my first gun charge. We're up. You know the shotgun that I threw and it hit the arm fed? I'm still on license for that. I'm at the pier. I'm looking down. It's the Thames. Fuck. And these other two guys have just followed me to the pier. So now I've looked at them. <laughs> I'm desperate. I said to them, right, who's, who's jumping? They've looked at me like, what? Jump. I've looked at them, I said, nah, 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 nah. One of you jump. Let's go, lads. We can hear the fucking feds running down. Please stop. You know, the noise that make when they're running after you. They said, um, nah, nah, nah. We're trying to, I'm trying to persuade them to jump. Because if one of them floats, I'm going to jump in there. I'm going to take the risk. All right. Because I'm on license and I don't know if the geezer in the car has got away with the gun. And that's the chance I was looking to take if one of them jumped. But neither of us jumped and we got nicked to the pier. Right? We got nicked to the pier, chucked into the, uh, the van. The police are saying, oh, they haven't searched the car properly. So I say, oh, stolen car, blah, blah, blah. I'm thinking the guy must have went with the gun. Um, they find the gun while I'm in a car in the van. I am fuming. The fucking geezer shit his pants and left the gun in the car. Now they've managed to link that gun and this sledgehammer that I had in the boot with a previous robbery that just happened about two hours ago. They've trapped me into Belmarsh. I am fuming. I'm like, fuck, you know, I can't believe you left the gun. Up till to, it's always oh, it took me about 12 years to get over the fact that the geezer left the gun in there, man. 
Like, what the fuck? You could, even if you told me I was at the pier, I would have threw that shit into the river, right? Anyway, I'm in Belmarsh, remanded for aggravated burglary. I'm thinking aggravated burglary. I didn't think it was a big deal. Burglary, right? It's got a burglary in it. First aggravated burglary, I get 12 years. First aggravated burglary. I'm thinking it's a shitty burglary. Everyone does burglaries, right? It's a fucking serious offense. Aggravated burglary is a serious offense. So <clears throat> anyway, I'm in Belmarsh. I'm thinking, how am I going to fight this case? I get a visitor at the reception. Now, everyone knows, guys, if you get a visitor that you haven't put down on a VO, visiting order, and the right reception is police. So police call me to reception. I don't know it's police. They don't want to tell me. The officers, I just turn up thinking, what's going on? This is uh, Trident officers, right? Now, Trident officers investigate gun crime. You get Trident South and Trident North. Trident North, no, Trident North, I think is, I don't want to get mixed up. I think Trident North investigates minor gun offenses. Trident South investigates murders and serious, like attempted murders and stuff like that. So I turn up to reception. This tall, skinny officer is standing there. Uh, he wants to ask me something, but he hasn't got the facilities to question me in the prison in Belmarsh. He wants to take me out to a police station called Plumstead Police Station. So I get in a car. He can't tell me. I only find out now that when you're on prison ground, if they're coming to investigate uh, uh, an offence, they cannot tell you until you step off into into public uh, public roads, what they're arresting you for or whatever. So they can't say, oh, I'm arresting you. They have to take you off the prison grounds. So he told me. So I'm in a car. They take me to, uh, they take me to Plumstead Police Station. So he's just, just light chap. Hey, you know, uh, some guys broke into a house and they shot a man in the throat with a shotgun. Do you know anything about that? I'm like, no, no, you know, what are you talking about to get me to the police station? I'm fully compliant. Yes, officer, what do you need? You know, anything to help with your investigation. Cause I'm thinking, dude, you got nothing on me, right? You know, you have to sign this paperwork, you know, to agree to a identification parade. I'm like, yes, fine. Right. I'll agree to that. Whatever. I'm thinking nothing's going to come back from this. Anyway, the first charge. Yeah. I would have broken into this house. I didn't even make it to Tony's fucking address. I get 12 years for that. I get 12 years for that. I am fuming. I remember they asked us to stand up. I've got two of my co-defendants. They say, Mr. Mr. McGansey, that's me. Can you stand up? You know, they said that I went into the house. And what hurts me the most is that I didn't go into the house. Right? I say it up. Yeah. Attribute me the right role. Don't say I went into the house. Because remember the guy that was carrying a gun managed to get away. They said three bods went into the house. The guy that got away went into the house. I set up the robbery, but these cunts, I'm just trying to say that I've gone into the house that pissed me off even more because the tallest person there was 5'7". I'm fucking 6'4". Six, six, <laughs> How did I get away with that? Fine, I get a guilty. They whack me with a 12. Despite the fact, right, that, sorry, let me just wind it back. Before I got guilty, before I got guilty, I'm in uh, um, HMP Br uh, Brixton. Right, I'm in there and one of my comrades, yeah, one of my um, uh, boys comes in there. So he comes in there, I'm looking at him, I'm thinking, how, the, how come you're here? He goes, um, he goes, mate, fucking hell, police raided my house and they found three guns, or supposedly they found three fucking guns, you know, and they've got me here, all right? So they allegedly seen four or three guns out of the house when they raided this house. So we're in a cell together. You know, they say misery loves company. As much as I didn't want him to be there, but I was happy that he was there with me. <laughs> right. Friends love to be, you know, I wouldn't want him to be in trouble, but if you're going through something, you want to go through it with someone that you know. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Misery loves company. So we're chilling in there. We're talking about the good old days because we went to school together and everything. Fucking hell, man. Those were the days. My door cracks open. I said, Mr. McGanzy, you got a cool appearance. So I'm like, cool appearance? What the fuck? All right, cool. 
get up, chuck me in the back of the sweat box in the London Crown Court. So now I've done six months in the can, right? The prosecution are not ready to go ahead with the trial. There's a thing called custody time limit by law. The prosecution have got me in there. Within six months, they have to prepare a case. If they haven't prepared a case and they're not ready and threw out no fault of mine, I have to get given bail. So they give me bail, right? As they give me bail, the police are fuming, right? I'm out for two weeks. Part of my bail conditions, signing on. So I go into Plaster Police Station to sign on. Plaster, St. area, East London. I gotta go sign on. One time I turn up, two weeks in, these lot have been working overtime. We got to get him back in there, right? I turn up to a police station. When I turn up to this police station, the whole police station is shut down. No one's reporting any crimes. Mm, it's very ironic, isn't it? What's, what's going on here? I'm here to sign on. You've got two doors. One of them's for law-abiding civilians to go in there and, hey, you know, someone broke into my house. And the other doors for people that are on tag and shit like that to go and sign on and leave. But I turn up to the police station and there's nobody in there. Not even the uh, behind the desk. So I'm thinking to myself, what's going on? Something's not right. They've shut down the police station. So I go into the main police station to sign on. Someone pops their head out from underneath the desk and says, Mr. McKenzie. I said, yes. What's going on? They said, yes, yes, yes. We've got someone that's looking to talk to you. Someone that's looking to have a chat with you. So I said, right, fine. The police, obviously I got custody, there's a time limit, I've been given bail. They were working on more cases to try and hit me with. But now that they've run out of time, they've got to try and hit me with them now. So I'm waiting there. A woman pops her head out from the, the, the brown door next to the main door that I went in. I say, please come in here, we want to interview you about something. So I go in. I've never seen this woman before in my life. She sat across the desk from me. She goes, I want to ask you about uh, some offences that took place, but um, I'm waiting for my colleague to come into the room, right? Before we interview you about it or ask you about it. I said, fine. Remember, I'm fully compliant. Hey, you know, even up till now, I get pulled over the police. Hey, how may I help you? Right? She says, uh, her colleague knocks on the door, comes in. It's the same fed officer that interviewed, that, that's, that interviewed me about shooting this geezer in the throat, yeah? six months before then. So I looked at him, I thought, oh shit, I know this guy. And he looked at me smirking, mate. <laughs> so I looked at him, I thought, oh shit, who the fuck's this bird now? I'm thinking, who's this bird? She says she's interviewing two cases where I shot a guy out of a bedroom window, supposedly me, right? And another case where I supposedly shot this guy in the back. So I'm thinking, oh shit. So now they're linking up all the aggravated burglaries. They're linking up all these aggravated burglaries that have resulted in shootings. You know, so these people have been getting shot in their homes. So we've got a serial home invader that likes to shoot people in their homes. So now I'm thinking, fuck, right? You know, you go along to just try and hear what they've got. They said, oh, no, they said to me, we haven't got um, the facilities to interview you here. We're going to take you to another police station, which is Forest Gate. I don't know if you heard of Forest Gate area. That was a Trident base at the time. They took me in there. I didn't see road again until I was a grown man. So I've gone in, right? And uh, the two, two other cases have crumbled where this guy supposedly got shot out of his bedroom window and the other guy got shot in the back. Those cases have fell off. It's just this one case. Now this one case that they're talking about, which I can talk about now, um, I've got a call, right? This is before the initial 12 year sentence. Remember, I was active every day. As soon as my eyes opened, someone's days ruined. Remember, we had a list of addresses. So we'll be flying through addresses. You know, we just have to pick when. So we've got all the information and this address and how many people are in here and who's this and who's this and who. So we just go, we're going down the list. So I get a call one day. This little kid says to me, listen, my uncle's got 70 grand right now. I'm in his house with him. Come and get it. He said it by text. He sent it by text, I knew who it was. He sent me the address, he says, come now. Because he slipped up into the toilet, I sent the text, went back with his uncle. I'm thinking 70 grand, uh, 70 grand. Uh, is it worth, 
even though I wasn't doing anything, at the end of the day, we have to risk guy there with the gun, fucking stolen car to get there for 70 quid. And they say, if there's three of us, that's not really a lot of money. It's not really worth the risk. 70 grand. So I run it by one or two guys I was with. I said, there's 70 grand in this house. We do not want to go for it. They're like, bro, we're not doing anything. We might as well. Went there. We've gone into this house. We've landed 12 o'clock at night, right? This is off the high street in Bethnal Green. Fucking parked up, got the shotgun, sledgehammer. So I'm thinking, shit, we might have to sledgehammer this door because we know exactly where the cash is. So there's one thing. We can either rush into the premises if there's no one in there, you sledgehammer the door, force entry, go straight to where the cash is and leave if there's no one in there. Or you can just wait for someone to come out and you can force them in there quietly. You have all the time in the world. So we go to this house. First thing that I did, turn the knob, the door, yeah, handle. The door's open. I'm thinking, what the hell? The lights are on. Back of my mind, I'm thinking, because this kid set me up. They can't be same. Surely this can't be a set. I said, he's not that stupid. This kid had left the house already with his uncle. After he sent the text message, his uncle said to him, listen, I got a bad feeling about this, man. I'm not keeping my money here. Come, 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 come. I'm going to stash it somewhere else. So the little punk didn't get a chance to send me another text message saying abort the mission, right? Because he didn't want to look suspicious. Just in case, he tells his uncle, one minute, runs back, tries to send me a text message. He doesn't get through to me and the house still gets raided, right? So he didn't send me a text message. We've come through the house. The door's open. The lights are on. Went straight upstairs. As we've got upstairs, he's told me it's the first door on the right when you get to the top of the stairs. We got to the door. Oh, fucking hell. The uncle's got one of those little makeshift fucking locks on the door. I'm thinking, oh, I've got to break this door down. It doesn't get no worse than this. I thought this was an easy job. Kicking down this door now, forcing entry into this door. We're already inside the house. One of the boys that I was with, who left the shotgun, <laughs> this other case, <laughs> he's heard movement happening down the corridor in the bathroom. So he goes, there's someone in the bathroom. So I'm like, fucking hell, let's go in there, get into the bathroom. We're trying to force our way into the bathroom. There's a woman in the bathroom, butt naked, breast out. You know, fully exposed, ah, making noise. Chill out, we're not here for you. But what you're not going to do is stay in this bathroom. You're going to come into the room that we're searching in and we just broke into you. I'm going to search, find what we're looking for. You'll be all right. So we're, we're telling her, listen, you're all right, man. Just comply, come in, come out here, get into that room. Let's finish searching this room. She's making noise. She can see the gun, right? Force it into the room. She's butt naked, she's on her knees like that, covering herself and shit. We searched the house, didn't find anything. So I'm like, what? Why have we came all this way? I said, right, that's it, expand the search, ne next room. Maybe it's not in here, it could be in another room. We're searching another room. Don't find anything. I said, right, you downstairs, search downstairs. Yeah, he's gone into the living room. Little do we know, there's a Jamaican man dreadlocked right he heard us kicking down the door forcing entry into the door down the corridor he's leaped out of his bathroom window onto the front patio snuck back inside the house straight into the living room so he's underneath us the whole time we're rummaging upstairs he's called the police when he's called the police he's armed himself with a knife remember you asked me has anyone defended the, the house he armed himself with a knife He's waited for us to expand the search. So one of the boys has gone downstairs to, 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 to force entry into one of the rooms. The Jamaican man's behind the door, waiting. So he's trying to force. He's like, there's someone in there. As soon as he said there's someone in there, I'm in between the staircase and the bedroom so I can keep an eye on the woman and the guy. And this other boy expanding the search downstairs. Jamaican man jumps out. Real aggressive. And he was about my height as well. Swinging the knife. The boy shits his pants. Runs down the corridor screaming my name. Ghost! Mate, I've already got you covered. You know from when we step inside the premises and I've got the gun, it's my job to ensure that there's no damage that's going to happen to any of the people that I've come with. He didn't need to shout my name. Anyway, I've leaned over. The corridor while the Jamaican man's chasing him with a knife. 
shot the guy. But thank God, as I fired the shotgun at the guy, close range. As he's running through uh, the corridor, there's a shelf that they used to keep shoes on. The wadding has gone through the shelf. And the rest that managed to make it through the shelves hit the guy in the throat. And his necks burst and started fizzing. Blood pouring down. I don't know if I've hit a major vein or something like that. Blood's just fizzed out. Jamaican man just runs straight out of the house. Straight onto the main road in his boxes. So now the whole scene's turned crazy. It's messy now. There's blood everywhere. Wooden floor. It's just pissing full of blood. I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> We just came here for cash. What is happening? So now I'm like, listen, fuck the cash. Let's get out of here. We might to proceed to try and get out of the house, right? Everyone's slipping up on blood as we're running down the stairs. Got in the car. As I'm driving onto the main road, I see the Jamaican man with the police. But the police that he had rung that were heading to the house, see a big black Jamaican man with blood trickling down his throat, holding a knife. They're like, forget the robbery, burglary. Because remember, he rang him thinking it's a burglary. So the police, the information the police have is just a burglary. They don't know the robbers are armed. He's, um, the police have jumped out on him because they're like, the burglary can wait. This guy is in public with a knife. If this guy knifes someone right now and we're recorded driving past, we're screwed. So we've got to handle this situation, man. This is a most importance right so they've got oh, they're trying to talk him down i drove right by them i've looked at the whole situation as i drove past and then that's caught up with me two years down the line so as i'm serving 12 years for this aggravated burglary which i was sour about because i didn't do it but hey i take responsibility because i set it up but i didn't play the role that they said i played and i got 12 years and the guys that supported is running there got eight years two years down the line to draw me back in court for shooting three other people on three different occasions in our homes. Two of the cases fall, sorry, did they make it in court into court? They fell full through. And this this case with the Jamaican guy stuck. And that one I got 16 years on top of my 12. So all in all, in totality, I ended up with like 59 years, all of them put together. When they nicked me, they nicked me for 24 charges. All of them. So all in all, now as we talk, I'm my conviction is probably all gun offences. I've, I've, I've been caught up to that. Arrested for like eight or convicted for eight separate gun offences at a time. So it all ran concurrent? It all ended up running concurrent. Who the fuck was the guy who never took the gun and then the guy who shouted your name? I hope you're still That's, not friends. No, nah, no way. This guy still owes me money, but I've let him... I've let, <laughs> he still Stay owes, back from him, bro. You end up doing another 20. A hundred. This guy, man. This guy just... He was the worst. Do you know what? Why let did me you stick by him? Why did I stick by him? Yeah. Do you know what? So, he's like laughing. This, um, to, to, to be honest with you, yeah, there's one time, yeah, I've gone on a job and in this job, someone ended up getting shot in this job, right? And uh, this fucking guy, his face turned red. You know, when someone's blood just rushes from them and you can see that this is not for them. Yeah. But because you've got love for someone, you turn a blind eye on it and you say, nah, do you know what? I'm just overlooking things. Now, my friend that got caught with the free gun offences, he uh, ended up beating the cases, right? Because uh, as we know, the police and the politicians are worse than actual criminals because these lot, That's not all criminals. police, yeah, yeah. not all police, but some of the police are corrupt as, you know what I'm saying? And the politicians, they're even worse. So he ended up beating the case. One of my friends, <clears throat> he was on bail, right? Um, for shooting a geezer in the face, obviously, allegedly shooting a geezer in the face. He had a bike helmet on, so they couldn't prove anything. He was heading to go to, to, to a police station um, to find out whether they're gonna charge him, right? Or they're gonna drop the case. Cause they tried to say the shooter had a bike helmet on, right? And um, the police, knew the route that he takes, that he's going to take to get to their police station. So they parked up and waited. As soon as they saw him heading, still miles away from the police station, they pulled him, forced him into a car. And they took him to a graveyard. And they said, uh, you know, what information have you got on me? This time I'm already in prison, right? 
So I think they wanted to kind of seal, seal the the deal and make sure I never come out, right? And you know, they said, oh, you know, you see that grave, you, you know, that's gonna be you in there next. You know, what information have you got for us? So they try, kind of tried to peer pressure him, and they tried to offer him uh, to to drop the charges, even though he hadn't been charged with anything. And at the time, he was heading to the police station to have the case, the charges dropped because they couldn't pursue it any further. But the last roll of dice was to try and lean on him and see if they can squeeze any information out of him um, to try and seal a conviction to make sure I never come out. And um, yeah, those that, that's just been how it's been going. And, you know, a bit off track, but some of those boys are with me here today, you know, mm -hmm. but they've turned their lives around as well there. Stand up, uh, guys. See the guys that were giving you jobs and you, they take 50%? Yeah. How is it when someone's trying to set up their uncle? You're not thinking fucking untrustworthy bastards. Like, nobody's... Listen, I've had worse. I'm not even going to lie. I don't know. I've had worse. I've, the, Does that I've, make I've you paranoid? Calls, I've had calls come through about people's own grandmother. My grandmother's got 350 grand in the house. You know, um, I didn't do that, you know. I don't know, bro. I think you were up for any job, mate. No, no. Do you know what? <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? That didn't happen because God didn't will it, it to happen. But obviously, no one's going to get hurt. If I was going to do that, it's kind of slimy. I didn't... Uh, it's not. It's more slimy from the people trying to set up their own grandma. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Their uncle. I've had that. I've had calls, all types of calls, all types of calls. But the thing is, we're game, man. We're game. We're game. Whatever it is. Are you just seeing a job? It's a job. It's nothing personal. It's the, you know, and the thing is, when we do come through that place, man, listen, it's chilling. You know, we, 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 um, master the art of, um, of intimidation without shouting or, you know, like, you know, that chill, you know, when you get that chill come through the back of your neck and it's like, oh my God, today could be my last day. You know, um, I have gone out my way to try and embody that you know, without making noise, very politely, you know. Now, let me tell you something, people they take um, serious in life are those that don't shout, they don't scream. When you're in an awkward predicament and they know they've got you in an awkward predicament and you know in a bad, bad, bad place and they're very calm with it as well and you know the power's all in their hand, this is not a situation that's negotiable. Yeah, this what, is that's gonna happen. what was the go-to thing they used to say? Like you say, it's a chilling experience. You know yourself, it's cold. Yeah. It's like a death. Yeah. The whole room goes yes, fucking yes, yes, cold. Yes, so yes. what was the one thing to try and make people calm, but know that you're not there to fuck about? No, no. Do you know what? Um, I think it's all to do with aura, though. It's it, it's not, because each moment has something different. You can't say the same thing for all situations. You know, for me, it would just be that, that precise. I think it's within the, those first first 10 seconds, you know, you've got to try and secure and calm them down. I uh, mastered the art of invading space. So I don't choke you or anything like that. You know, I literally invade your space. It's like a hug. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm very calm with what I'm saying. I've come prepped for whatever situation it is. You know, I'm coming for this and I'm going to take it. It's non-negotiable. It doesn't matter who you are. What you've done, we all have a time and a date of death. If it's the day, you have that feeling that today, I think is the day that I'm going to leave the earth. You know, that in itself, almost, if not most of the times, makes people comply. But to be honest, I don't never really need information from them because I've already got the information. It's just to calm the situation down. And what you would find is that I've been in a couple of situations where people crack jokes I just to try and calm the nerves and they end up being compliant, helping you, you know, <laughs> packing away their money with, hey, do you need help with that? I've got the stuff over there just to try and get you out of the house, you know? But we didn't just do houses, we've done businesses and stuff like that as well. You know? What's the one thing that sticks in your mind? Because obviously we all have a conscience, yeah. no matter how big, no matter how game we think we are, the brain plays tricks, the screams, the shouting, yeah. the destruction the lives that are ruined as well. Like yeah. I said, the guys we had on earlier, Kev proper back in the day, the guy destroyed his life 30 years, sitting, crying, broken, suicidal, homeless, because of he got tortured, kidnapped, and he was the wrong man. Do you think about the 
the victims or is that a case no of- I've tried no, honestly I've reached out to my victims to try and do restorative justice you know restorative justice yeah that's what they two are doing yeah restorative justice no my victims didn't want to know man yeah, because I'd be scared. Don't like, screw you, man. Yeah, we think you're full of shit. <laughs> you know He's what? a psycho. Screw because you. That's what I was thinking of, Kev, because it is psychotic behaviour. Right. It is deluded fucking yeah. thinking. Like, it's yeah. a psych- psychopath. Yeah. But in their mind, like it is closure. And to, to sit across from someone and admit, I'm sorry, that takes massive balls, man. Yeah, no, that's no, no, next seriously. level stuff. Seriously, I've reached out. All my victims have reached out, man. Because what I didn't want him to think is when I come out, because you've grasped on me, you know, I'm gonna put you away. No, no, no. Listen, it's that's been and gone. Do you know what I'm saying? That time's been and gone. I've done my time. Furthermore, I'd like to apologize for you getting even getting caught up in that situation. But these are the legitimate, the law abiding people that got caught up in it. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? But then you get those that are still out there doing playing the game. If you're not playing the game and you've been caught up in it, I'll reach out and apologize. Do you mess up? No. You're fucking lying. No, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. That's the first time I've seen you break no, character. Seriously, seriously, I swear to God, Dad. You know what? I, I actually don't. I actually don't. Do you know what? I do who I do feel sorry for the boys that are caught up in there because I could have easily been in that situation with them. Do you know what I'm saying? And there is some innocent people in prisons as well. There's some innocent buds in prison that didn't do nothing. You know, like they didn't, they just got caught up with someone else and they couldn't say what happened. And yeah. they just sat in there 30 years, just racking their brains, consistently thinking of suicide and stuff like that. Man, listen, this shit ain't a game for those young kids out there that are running around. The person that you are now, this is a message for the young kids that are out there running around. The person that you are now, come 10 years time, I highly doubt you'd be that same person. You know, if you're not, if you haven't got kids and your kids haven't taken priority or, you know, if you haven't lost a family member or, you know, your boys haven't turned on you, you're not going to be playing this game for long, you know. Yeah, I know you were bitter about because you never went through that door, but all the ones you get away with, does it make it a bit easier? Like you start putting your hands up and going, okay, it was only a matter of time before I got caught or got killed anyway. No, I think I would have probably got killed before I got caught because I was very good. Like I said, it's the guy that left the track behind. The police had no idea who they were chasing the whole time. You know that Kaiser Soze? Yeah. The police had no idea who they were chasing the whole time. But this kid, right, who I forgive, I forgive him, of course, right, his nerves got the better of him. You know, he t- crumbled, man. And like I said, I was, it's a, maybe it's a, everything happens for a reason. I don't regret anything. I don't regret anything. I don't sit there. I don't place blame for, you know, anyone for anything. I take full responsibility for what's happened, you know. And I, I've learned from that as well. You know. How was prison for you? Oh, I got caught up in all types of shit in prison. I got caught up in a murder in prison. You know, I attempted murders in prison. Prison, prison's where a lot of my maturity grew, uh, stemmed to happen. You know, I uh, matured in prison because I got a chance to rub shoulders with people that were way worse than me, man. Way worse than me. And I'm thinking to myself, do you know what? I think when I went into prison, I was uh, very uh, hyped. It's not very high, but somewhat, you know, like you, like you have like a personality, like ego type of thing. You think, yeah, I've done this and I've done that and I'm a big man. Then you go up north and you meet some of them boys from up north, you know, geezers in for free murders, butchered everyone in the house. And you're like, what? And you never know. Very polite, well-spoken guy. And you're like, oh my gosh, this guy's a monster. I thought I was one. This guy, oh, natural life. You know, some of these guys never coming out. You get 37 wrecks, 35 wrecks. I've been with people with 37s, 35s that ain't coming home, you know. And I, I appreciate the fact that I got a second chance, you know. Um, and man, at 20, it was a wake up call for me. Do you know what I mean? So um, there's people that ain't coming home, man. And there's people way worse than whoever's watching right now that thinks that they're game. You know, you're not really gay, man. Yeah, you Guy. just don't know who is. Yeah. I've interviewed many people where you think, nah, fucking idiot. Yeah. But they would fucking wait in your, behind your bin, under yeah. your car, yeah. Yeah. and just put one right behind you. A hundred percent. And you would never in a million years a think that they were, they, were, they were triggered. Appearances can, that's what yeah, I learned from yeah, prison. Yeah. Appearances can be very deceiving. Mm-hmm. Never judge anyone, no matter how small, big, or whatever whatever they got got. Never charge, never judge anyone, you know, because anyone's capable of anything. You know. When did you start working on yourself to try and see life a bit differently, to then try and become a bit cleaner? I think it's a, I threw this kid off the staircase in prison. 
<laughs> and uh, they threw me in a block. So I was in a block for a long time. Spent like five months in a block. Segregation. That's a long time. Two weeks in the seg is a long time. You know, the segregation, you lose concept of time. You know, all you do is sleep in the seg. Um, no radio, no TV, two magazines that you've read back to front, front to back. Right? And you're in there. And all you do is sleep, so you'd wake up, there's a blurry window, you look out, you're like, what time is it? You don't know if it's six in the morning or six at night, especially at winter time. You know, like right now you'd wake up, you think it's six in the morning. Man, that shit is where you actually have to, that's where the battle is. You know, you have to think to yourself, I'm a grown man and I'm getting time, I'm in a timeout. You know, what am I doing with myself? I'm in prison and I thought shit can't get worse. And now I'm locked away from everyone else, right? And I can't even mix with anyone else. Human interaction is so, so important for us to interact with each other. And no matter what situation you're in, to try and comfort each other one way or the other. When that gets taken away from you, even in prison, you know, there's something wrong, man. Especially if you're going, you know, you're thinking about coming out and doing something with yourself because you can't keep doing this, man. Why did you throw him down the stairs? Oh man, it was, I used to beat people up in prison. Yeah, yeah, when, I, when you first get in there, because I had a bit of size and you, had, you find kids that are thinking that they're tough. So, you, you know, I, I used, to, I wasn't proud of shit like that, you know. Um, I used to, I, I used to do some bad shit in there, you know. So I threw this kid down the stairs because we were beating him up and um, he was dodging my punches. So I was like, you know what, let's see if you can dodge this. I grabbed him and I... <laughs> threw him off the staircase and it landed on his head. And he's, I heard like a loud crack. And you won't believe this, as he landed, there was a governor that was showing other outside visitors of the prison around the prison. And as he's landed, the governors were walking up the stairs and this kid came flying down the stairs, landed on his head, stopped moving. The governors looked up and they saw me and I ran. I don't know where I was running to, but I ran to my pad, hid in my room. The governor came right in there. He says, you gotta go. He's pacing up and down. We can't have you here. You gotta go. We don't even know if he's, re if he, if he's responding, you know, like you gotta go. We, we, you know, we're gonna have to press charges on this. And I'm thinking to myself, why did I do that? You know, I, all these things lead up to, you know, you critiquing yourself and thinking, nah, man, I shouldn't be acting like this. I'm too old. At that time, I was only 23. <laughs> I was thinking, nah, man, I can't be doing this, you know. But prison for me, it was a wake-up call, you know. Even the, the fact that, you know, people go into prisons and some of them don't come out, come out of prisons, you know. Like the kid that I told you, I don't know, I told you there's a kid that got killed in prison. He didn't come out. He had eight weeks left. He had eight weeks left to go into a situation with another kid. You know, over a mobile phone, and he got he he got stabbed and he died. He didn't make it home. Eight weeks. You go in there thinking, you know, I'm gonna do my bed and go home, see my mom, see my girl, see my kids, and you get into a stupid situation with a small guy, and he puts you to bed. You don't come out. You know, over a phone. Did you get psychiatric reports? Yeah. They must have been off the fucking yeah, chart. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The judge requested for those. Yeah, the judge. It's obviously. Speak, I, I had have to, you on off people. I know people. I uh, can see you've got it, and you're like, and I can see you're a big fucking nutcase. I, I can also see you're trying to change, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see with those psychiatric reports, yeah. mate. I would love to see them, mate. Yeah. Uh, I was the surprised judge, they didn't keep. I had you to in. do thirty courses to get out of there. Yeah, I'm surprised 30, you never do hundred and thirty, mate. I'm surprised seriously. they didn't keep you in. I tell you, I tell you what though. Um, Did you like violence? I. I I like it if it's swift. Do, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no drama. Like merciful, like violence. You know, so I had people, you see people in prisons used to show me videos of people getting knifed like 50 times. I'm like, bro, don't show me that. They're like, yeah, but like, you know, you do shit like this. I said, bro, listen, if you're going to do anything malicious to someone, be swift of what you're doing. Do you know what I'm saying? Don't, I don't promote violence, guys. All right. But don't, Fucking show me that sick shit. If you're gonna do something swift and leave, you know. When his kid died in prison, I remember he died in front of 60 people, right? He got knifed. 
and died. And I remember I was with some people that were serving time for murder, double murder, right? Double murder, um, murder and attempted murder. And when they, when they saw the, the the guy dying, yeah, that haunted them. And you think that this guy's put away two people who's in prison serving a, a sentence for it. You know, he should be used to seeing this. No, nobody knifes up a person or sticks around and goes, oh, let me look in his eyes. Let me see what's happening. No, when they witnessed this kid stiffening, right? And his eyes pinging around his head, that woke up everyone that was there. And they came back because I didn't stick around. I, I shot off. I was like, fuck this. I knew what was happening. I was like, I'm off, right? They came back to me and they said, what does, that, what does it mean when he plants his foot next to his other foot and his leg stiffens and his hands stiffen and his eyes? I'm looking at him, I'm thinking, dude, you're in here for killing two people. I said, bro, that kid's dead. Before he was pronounced, I was able to tell them, that kid's dead, bro. Do you understand? Like, they're like, what? I'm like, that kid's dead. But funny enough, as soon as that kid died, murder, uh, homicide unit came straight for me. You know, like murder, murder squad, they came straight for me. They were like, yo, you know, because obviously what the, the officers claimed that they saw two people having an altercation and I, you know, I was involved in that altercation, some shit like that, which wasn't true, you know, allegedly. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But <laughs> yeah, they came to investigate. I you know they were all over my case, man. They were all over my case by it. But the kid beat the case. The kid initially beat the case and went home. And the kid that was meant to go home in eight weeks, he went home in a coffin. Imagine that. How how was it coming out? <clears throat> was it hard to stay? Can I tell you something? Yeah. When I got, when I got out of prison after ten years, it's as though I haven't left. And people are like, what? How? Bro, my brain wasn't melted, nothing. It's as though I've just been in a slumber and I just woke up. And it's like, well, what was that all about? The whole time I look forward to getting out and when I get out, it's as though there was nothing for me to look forward to because my sentence is done. You know, you get most people that try to have a mental breakdown and they're in their room rocking back and forth. None of that for me, man. The only thing that I was anxious about is the speed of the car that was going, even though they were doing 30 miles an hour, I was anxious about that because I haven't been moving at that speed for the past 10 years. I've been walking speed. Slow uh, motion. Yeah, slow motion. Everything's been slow motion for me. So I'm just walking around the exercise yard. I'm walking around 16 establishments that I've been in throughout my whole time because they moved me up and down the country because I was kind of influential in whatever prison that I went to. So I'm used to a walking pace. You know, I've done prison up in uh, Liverpool. I've done prison up in Wales. I was up in Wrexham, that super max, mm -hmm. no, not super max, that huge 3,000 prison and prisoners i was up in cambridge i was up in sussex surrey everywhere not in um loudon grange i've done the whole tour man i've done the whole tour but apart from just the speed of the car man if you're look, looking at me now if you were to walk past me in the street you didn't know i just come out during the pandemic you know you never know where does the name ghost come from i've had that since i was a kid how the fuck can you call your ghost? Just six feet five, fucking. But that's the thing, six foot five. But you never see me coming. Is that why they call it ghost? You never see me coming. Tell you a lot. To, to be honest with you, they call me ghost because I used to do music. Is that that? Yeah. Yes, I used to do yeah. music. But after I stopped doing that trash, and went into something else, I actually had to embody that. That that that. Do you re regret leaving music? The music was trash. Yes, no, I don't. But did you ever listen to Jay Z and that at the start? They were fucking shit, man. No, they were they're fucking hard. It's minted now, isn't it? Yeah, of course, but that's consistency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. But yeah, no, the music was trash. The music was trash. But now I do more positive things. I'm giving back to the community. I teach people. Can you imagine that? Me, I teach people. You know, I'm I'm giving guys help. I'm helping giving to give guys second chances. I've come out of prison. I want to get into employment. What's your biggest regret? I don't have one. And I'm being honest. Everything happens for a reason. If I had a regret, I'll still be holding on to something that's happened in the past. In order to move forward and let go of everything, you have to accept whatever's happened. I accept everything. And I wouldn't change anything. 
Not a single thing. Because that's what's made me who I am today. You're doing a lot of positive changes now, which we'll touch on. How How's that? Try to do right in life, try to do better. Because everybody, no matter who it is, I'll speak to you. I know they've done bad shit, but I still know they've got it in them. They've still got that devil there. Mm. They've still got that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? So, so you know, mm. um, I stay away from like drama and stuff like that, you know, because um, I wouldn't want to be tested, put back in a situation like that. Do you worry that you could be tested? Because the next sentence life. Yeah. No, I, 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 I uh, tend to, I choose where I, I show up and where I don't show up because I, I don't want to be in that situation where I have to, you know, because I have, everyone's got that little voice in their head. Mine's, you know, somewhat a bit stronger than the normal person. You know, I start having an argument or not an argument, but a, like a conversation in my head where if any doubt starts coming into, into my space, then I feel like I've got to rectify that. One thing I never want to do or feel is that I don't know who I am or I'm second guessing myself or, you know, then there's problems, you know. Did there. you hear voices? No. Did no. you used to? I, I do talk to myself though, but that's, that's healthy, right? Yeah, yeah, I think People, everybody does. Yeah, yeah, I do talk to myself. Um, no, at one stage in prison, I, I, I you know, but it's because I was high in it. <laughs> Everybody hears voices when I'm high, bro. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? It's because it's because I was high, and I had to stop that shit because I was like, "Whoa, this." Did you go on jobs? Hi. Did you go on? No, jobs? no, 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 no. Yeah, because you, I'd be paranoid yeah, as fuck. No, no, no way, no way, no way. I, I, like Some I said, people pre do, though. yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's because I need nerves. The nerves have got the better of yeah. them. I'm chilled, man. I don't need alcohol. I'm never, I've always been one of them people. You know, if, if if I'm coming to do, you know, a capital punishment job and that's, I'm talking about, you know, shooting someone or some shit like that, that I enjoy doing. That, because, you know, that was just one stop and gone. You know, obviously I enjoyed making money as well, but retaliation, there was always something about, you know, like something um, euphoric about revenge, mm -hmm. you know. How's it now then, like I say, making changes and trying to do right in life and try to keep back from the trouble? Because, yeah, that's you're, even, because you're still young, man. That's even more young. rewarding, to be honest yeah. with you. Yeah, that's even more, because I'm an online coach yeah. now. Fitness How can online. people get, people might be fucking scared to work with you, man, but these things actually help because people go, do you know what, he's actually all right. He's a yeah. bit fucking disturbed. Yeah, because now, that's of the, the past. Shit you've done. That's, that's, yeah, of course, but yeah, that's the past. That's is why we'll touch on the positives yeah, yeah, for yeah. the online coaching. Mm -hmm. Like I say, you're a big fucking unit. You're mm -hmm. a man mountain. Mm -hmm. So how can, People get involved. Are you doing PT? Are you doing online so coaching? So I'm a PT, but only for a select few. Um, obviously, I got to vet you. <laughs> I'm fine at that. <laughs> do you ever worry about that? Okay, do a PT, and then you, it's someone who you had grievances with. No, past? I don't PT in the area. No, but do you know what I mean? Do you still have to search and look out who you're working with? Uh, I've, I think before I take them on, I already vet them. To be honest with you, yeah, you've always and, got to stand guard, no matter what. Yeah, and I feel like. For you to actually put yourself in a line like that, not to say I'm untouchable or not, but you know, I'm a bit of a psychopath. Like, do you know what I'm saying? If you want to put yourself in a line like that, nah, I'd scrap that, take that back, cut that part up. <laughs> I'm trying to sell myself here. <laughs> if you want to put yourself in a line like that, then I don't know, man. It's not, it's not ideal, man. You know, let's all push positive. So. Do you miss the old life? Nah, not one bit. Because obviously now, you know, I'm married and I got a kid. Congratulations. Thank brother. you. Thank you. That so, changes everything. Yes, yes, definitely. Can you imagine though your kids, they're married and someone rushes their house? Exactly. A couple of shotguns. Exactly. I understand. That's why I always knew going in there, I have to have the upper hand because I know if the person's in there, they'll do anything to protect the home. Do you understand? Obviously, the last thing I need to be doing is putting their dad down in front of the kids. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But or me getting put down in front of the kids, or the kids witnessing anything like that. Do you know what I mean? So um I'm there to control the situation, man. Pretty rarely that happened. Do you have any nightmares? No. I sleep soundly. Seriously, because I have accepted my responsibility and I've reached out to try and apologize to the people and I'm putting positive back into the community, online coaching, personal training, tutoring, and stuff like that, tutoring other people, you know. So I'm actually trying to do good, you know, trying to put back positive, you know, it's not all about just taking, it's about, I'm all about giving back now. The past four years that I've been out, I've been giving back to, to the community, you know. Where do you go forward for the future? Um, to be honest, I want to start up my own um, company, uh, hiring online coaches and stuff like that. You know, um, getting them to 
push forward um, my training system. So I'm designing a training system that I'm going to be um, pushing forward. But the only way I'm going to take on, I don't want to say too much about it. It's my idea. I don't mm-hmm. want to copyright it. But yeah, I, I've got I've got a, um, a big, um, big aspirations and plans. So you've got a dream. You and know? how can people get in contact? Like I say, what's your social media links and um, stuff? So I am Ghost Genetics. That's my Instagram. Um, and you know, if you need online coaching or fitness tips, you can find me on www.iamghostgenetics.com. How big is religion for you? Religions, that's what's changed me. You won't believe that. The reason why I don't touch on that too much is because I feel I don't want to put a stigma. I don't want to put a, a bad, I don't want people to associate that with me, even though it's something that's very personal, you know? Because a good person or a person that goes out of the way to try and reconnect with God, you know, how, even though it's a change and that's why it's happened, I don't want him to think, oh, you know, oh, that guy's Muslim and look at the stuff that he's done. Do you know what I mean? For me, it's very personal and that's why I've changed. I haven't really said that, but that's why I've changed. I pray five times a day. I've been praying five times a day for 15 years. And that's why I hope keep away, you know, all the bad thoughts i got to think about everything that I do, you know, before I do it. So for me, that's my fundamentals and that's why I'm good. I give back into the community. I try to do good to erase all the bad things that I've done. When was the last time you cried? Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. In a court, because I was pissed off that I got 12 years for something I didn't do. But I genuinely cried. And that was out of anger as well. You know them? (laughs) 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 That is the last time I cried. But um, other than that, I don't know, man. Right now, if something bad happens, I just I accept it, and I move on from that, man. You know. But what's the worst thing you've seen in prison? Ooh, there's been a few. Um, I've seen an attempted rape in prison. Yes, in Belmarsh. Yes, in, in Belmarsh, man. This, do you know what? One of the worst things I, I, I actually, I haven't said this before yet. One of the worst things that, that I um, regret is I used to, I used to take Mick out of this, um, this kid that used to walk like a cowboy. Right, um, I used to call him John Wayne. Right, he was in Belmarsh, and um, he, he had a funny walk. I used to get onto him dinner time. Like he's a grown man, right? But until one day, we're going to the showers. Now each landing has a shower on either side, right? So as I'm in the showers, before I got in there, I heard a guy screaming from the opposite side of the showers. And there's this black guy, massive black guy, stood over this other geezer, a white guy with a bald head, trying to force him to give him oral. This is in the marsh, right? And the guy had a mental breakdown. And uh, he says, I'm not doing it anymore. I've had enough. I've had enough. He went into like a frenzied, like, you know, like, crawled up like a little kid. I started crying. And this guy was still trying to force his genitalia in his face, you know? And I think he waited for him to get in the showers. But this, this, to be honest with you, this guy was very weird, man. He just used to chill by the landing and just look at everyone just walking up I, 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 I always used to think man what's up with this guy he never used to talk to anyone but that's because i think now it's all making sense he was looking around for who he can make sexual advances towards yeah, like for but i think from without a shadow of a doubt he was raping this guy without a shadow of a doubt without a shadow of a doubt he was raping this guy because this guy I was, the whole time i was in there with him he never walked normal and they were banged up together and that day that he had that mental breakdown saying, I'm not doing any, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm, I'm not letting you make advances. And he wasn't even looking at him when he was saying it. And this guy still had his towel open, stood over him like that, trying to crouch down in his face. That was scarring for me because I was like, whoa, you know, that could be anyone, man. That's, that's insane. How are you feeling today to coming on and speaking some madness and trying to change your life and do better? Uh, it's it's good. It's always good to get off your chest. It's like a therapy. Let's just. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. It's like I, you know. I, mm. I I don't so much therapy in there. It's like, not therapy. What is it? It's like um, counseling. Huh? Can, counseling. Is it counseling? <clears throat> no, it's therapy. Is it therapy? Yeah, 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 yeah. To get because you'd have been fucking basically a cat. I'm not even gonna lie to you. 
I done so much. I spent a lot of time with one of my friends in there. Paul Wallen, have you heard of Paul Wallen? Mm. He had a co-defendant called Lee Murray. Yeah, I know Lee Murray. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lee Murray's co-defendant. The one that came back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I spent a lot of time with him. Me and him just used to crack jokes. And that's how we got through a lot of our time. He's a good fella. But I done so much therapy, right? That, um, man, started fucking being their therapist. You know, like... You, you try to predict all the moves that they're, you know, because because they they got uh, literally um, they've got to uh, assess you, you know, like mm -hmm. so they'll say things like they'll set up situations or the red flag situations. So I've done so much of that stuff that I was able to kind of like see the game gameplay and watch them observe me type of shit. You know, so that thing can either it can either you know I don't know like get you but you can become better at that type of stuff like mental games mind mm -hmm. games and stuff like everything that. is a game to you like you say it's like a chess game yeah, calculated yeah, 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 yeah. and try to assess everybody and be in control yeah, yeah control yeah. for it you try and control every situation ah, and they, no but but there's certain situations i can't control and i accept that as well like what um if a girl doesn't want to be with you <laughs> when are you most vulnerable breaking someone's heart if i'm going to be honest mm -hmm. whether that's me my, my brothers or you know, whoever's, whoever I'm, you know, if, I, if, if it's my wife or family member or yeah. the, the boys that you see me with, you know, um, that for me, you know, someone turns around and said, oh, I thought I knew you. I thought you was my friend. You know, like, I thought you was my brother type of shit. And then you're like, like I said to you, second guessing yourself, like, you know, when you go away thinking, shit, man, that was a bit intense. What was that? What am I doing type of thing? That's my, that's, that's. I shouldn't even be telling them this because then they'll, they'll probably be, putting, they'll probably be yeah. putting, putting these cards. Hey man, I thought I knew you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do <Yeah>. that. <laughs> so how, like I say, man, for the shit that you've done, the shit yeah. that you've been involved in to yeah. then try to make changes. Yeah. Got your missus now, baby on the way. It's yeah. a beautiful thing and yeah. it shows that people can change. Yeah. And uh, listen, I wish you nothing but the best success. Thank you, thank you very much for having me. the rest of your life, yeah. And would you like to finish up on anything else, brother? Uh... It's just, um, just a message for the youth, you know, um, you know, life's short, you know, um, try and make the best choices that you can in your life. And the reason why I've told my story, not to, um, it's not to glamorize violence or, you know, um, to give you any ideas is to, to you, for you to learn from my story and not go down the same road that I've gone down. You know, it might seem like fun and games at the beginning, but at the end, you're the one that gets to lose and you're the, you're the ultimate loser in this thing here, you know. For anybody watching that's maybe in a life of struggle right now, yeah. what advice would you have for them? Listen, um, at this precise moment in your life, it can't get any worse. The only way is up, you know. There was one, there was a, <coughs> a time in my life where I was fighting my trial from the block, from the segregation, and I've been in there five months, and I was fighting the trial from there, and I wasn't allowed to mix with anyone else, and I was already serving 12 years. And I was looking at a possibility of another life, uh, of a life sentence, you know, because they were trying to push for, for a life sentence. And mentally, I couldn't get any lower. But one thing that you got to remember is life is not one straight line, you know, and it's not always on an incline. There's always going to be a dip. There's going to be an incline. So it's got to, it's going to get better, you know. It, it never stays at that precise um, depth, man. You just got to keep hope. Adam. Listen, for coming on today. Thanks for having thoroughly me. Thoroughly enjoyed your story, man. Thank it's you, been man. a bit of a mad roller coaster, but I genuinely wish you nothing but the best uh, for the future, my brother. Thank you so much brother. for having me on, brother. God bless you, bro. Uh, you too, brother.